The Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that the chairman be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, if members insert a document, document into the record, please also email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. Again, that's documentsti at mail.house.gov. Obviously, I am not uh, Sam Graves. The chairman is uh, tied up trying to get to D.C. like so many people are, and uh, so I've been asked to uh, fill in in his stead. I now recognize myself for the purposes of an opening statement for five minutes. We are here today to discuss the state of transportation network and our nation's ability to effectively and efficiently move goods through our supply chain. To achieve this goal, we must, we must make targeted investments to improve the infrastructure our shippers, truckers, and freighters rely on. We have work to do to improve our transportation network, and we have a responsibility to ensure that taxpayer funds are directed to projects that strengthen this system. Despite the clear needs of our system, the administration continues to push its green agenda through onerous regulations onto the American people instead of focusing its efforts on promptly distributing funds to projects that will meaningfully improve our roads, bridge, bridges, and ports. A recent example of these misguided regulations is the Federal Highway Administration's latest greenhouse gas emissions rule, something Congress expressly left out of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. However, our infrastructure system is just one factor to consider as we assess the state of transportation in the country. We also have to examine our supply chain. The pandemic previously exposed vulnerabilities in our supply chain, and today's global conflicts are presenting new and complex challenges we must address as well. For example, the United States Navy is currently leading the international coalition to repel Houthi militant attacks that are threatening a critical global shipping route in the Red Sea. These threats have forced major carriers to opt for longer, more costly shipping routes as they pause operations in the area. And closer to home, the migrant crisis at our southern, southern border has led to repeated closures of rail border crossings. As a result, rail operations were suspended, halting the movement of critical goods between the United States and Mexico in order to process the influx of migrant crossings. I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses today about the realities on the ground. The committee stands ready to provide dozens, pardon me, we will have dozens of solutions, but the committee stands ready to, pro to provide solutions. In May of last year, we advanced more than a dozen bills targeting supply chain, supply chain challenges. The testimony provided today will give us greater insight into what's working and what's not. We look forward to working with you to strengthen our nation's transportation network. I now recognize Ranking Member Larson for an opening statement for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Rouser, for holding this hearing on the state of transportation. And uh, uh, if uh, Sam needs to call anyone about getting into D.C., I'm sure he knows, knows someone. Uh, it's been a rough, rough time for a lot of travelers uh, over the last week, uh, for sure. Uh, this committee has a great story to tell when it comes to transportation, and I am pleased that today's hearing gives us a chance to do that. We'll find the state of transportation is strong, thanks to historic levels of transportation investment. Last Congress, this committee answered the calls of states, local and tribal governments, transit agencies, rail, airports, and ports to provide a much needed boost to the transportation network. Investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act have helped improve the economy and the state of transportation. By passing these bills, Congress gave the construction industry longer-term stability and certainty. As uh, Ms. Benford's t testimony points out, if Congress had not passed the BIL, contractors, quote, would likely have seen a cut of 20 to 30 percent in the work that they were able to bid on. Congress also gave communities across the country the means to take on game-changing projects. In the first two years of the BIL, USDOT distributed over $262 billion for states, localities, transit agencies, railroads, airports, and ports to carry out upgrades and priorities, and more is on the way. This includes $185 billion in highway funds, $41 billion in transit, and nearly $13 billion in airport funds. BIL, BIL funds have already supported over 40,000 projects that the USDOT administers. In the Two years since enact enactment, states have invested federal highway dollars into tens of thousands of additional projects. And today, there's at least one new project in every congressional district, thanks to the BIL. Projects across the country mean construction jobs in every region of the country. 
jobs with good wages, benefits, and working conditions. The BIL investment also means more jobs in transit, trucking, aviation, rail, and maritime sectors. The challenge now is to build and maintain a sufficient pool of skilled workers to tackle all the project opportunities offered by the BIL. And Mr. Millar's testimony from the great state of Washington uh, notes that the entire transportation industry is facing workforce challenges. The BIL includes over $800 million in dedicated funding to train workers for in-demand jobs in manufacturing, semiconductors, and more. It also includes new flexibility for state DOTs to use highway formula funds for apprenticeships, pre-apprenticeships, and community college and vocational school partnerships. Look forward to learning what more Congress can do to support workforce development and training. And the state of freight transportation is also strong thanks to congressional administrative actions in response to global shocks in the aftermath of the pandemic. The chair mentioned the work that this committee has done specifically over the last year, and BIL funding is helping as well, helping ports move cargo more efficiently, reduce emissions, and compete globally. BIL funding is also helping to tackle the biggest transportation uh, surface transportation bottlenecks. In the passage and implementation of the Bipartisan Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, which originated in this committee, thanks to uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Garamendi, has also helped to support a stronger supply chain. And we'll hear Mr. Edwards' testimony today, the international supply chain normalized in 23. Shipping container rates have fallen, port congestion has eased, shipper complaints have received quicker action and positive outcomes, and the Federal Maritime Commission has enhanced fee, fairness, and transparency. These reforms mean that when new international challenges arise and strain the global and domestic supply chain, the U.S. will be better prepared to react. So today's hearing is a welcome review of how well infrastructure investments are working, but keeping our transportation systems in good repair, resilient, and ready for the future freight and passenger demand will require an ongoing investment. Reliable and robust investment in infrastructure is key to the long-term success and sustainability of our transportation systems and supply chain networks for decades to come. And I'm committed to working with the chair of the full committee um, and even a substitute here today to ensure this committee continues to provide the necessary resources to support the economy, the traveling public, and America's transportation workers. And I want to thank the witnesses for being here today to help us out. And Mr. Chair, before we get started, if I could just ask an indulgence to do a quick introduction, Mr. Millar. Thank you. I so ordered. Thank you. We're going to hear from the Secretary of Transportation of the Washington State Department of Transportation, Roger Millar, who's who's here today despite our own state legislature just having uh, opened up their session. So he's probably got time to testify, answer questions, and get the heck out of Dodge to get back <laughs> get back home. But he was uh, our deputy in 2015 and appointed secretary in August of 2016, oversees an agency that is a steward of a complex multimodal transportation system and responsible for ensuring that people and goods move safely and efficiently. I won't go into his full uh, biography, but he's been active in uh, groups like uh, that are very familiar to us, including being the current president of AASHTO, um, the board of directors uh, there, as well as uh, actively involved in a variety of engineering uh, groups, uh, intelligent transportation system groups, uh, as well as a variety of other infrastructure. So great to have Roger here in town for the few moments he could spare uh, with us um, to help us out. So with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the American Traffic Safety Services Association dated January 17, 2024. Without objection, so ordered. I'd like to thank our uh, witnesses uh, for being here today. We're looking very much forward to uh, your testimony. Uh, briefly, I'd like to take a moment to explain our lighting system to you. I think you uh, know it pretty well, but uh, there are three lights, obviously. Green means go, yellow means uh, your time is coming to an end. And then uh, red means uh, wrap up just as quickly as you possibly can. I uh, ask unanimous consent that the witness's full statements be included in the record without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection, so ordered. As your written testimony has been made part of the record, the committee asks that each of you keep your oral remarks to five minutes if possible. With that, Mr. Stevens, uh, we're Mr. Stephen Edwards, CEO and Executive Director of the Virginia Port Authority. You are recognized for up to five minutes. 
If you can turn your microphone on and maybe bring it closer to you as well. Thank you so much. So thank you, Chairman Reza, Ranking Member Larson, and distinguished members of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. My name is Stephen Edwards, and as mentioned, I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the Virginia Port Authority. The Port Authority operates five marine terminals and one inland rail port. We are the third largest container port on the East Coast. As an operating port, we have responsibilities of a port authority, a marine terminal operator, we manage asset procurement and maintenance, technology systems, and we operate the Hampton Roads intermodal chassis pool. The Port of Virginia's tagline is America's most modern gateway, and we are proud of our ranking as the highest performing major North American container port in both 2021 and 22 at a time of stress in supply chains. During this period, we were the fastest growing major American port in 2021, and over the two-year period, second behind Houston. Presently, I have responsibility for a $1.4 billion gateway investment program, including deepening and widening channels in partnership with the Army Corps, expansion of semi-automated container capacity, berth strengthening, increased crane capability, advanced rail, and an offshore wind hub. And this is coupled with a state, state investment of circa $5 billion of capital improvements in tunnels, roads, and private sector investment in logistics parks. In totality, we really take the view of sea buoy to last mile delivery and from farm to ocean. As a port, as the largest East Coast rail hub, we service all of the Ohio Valley and Midwest states and further west, and our truck market largely serviced Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. This month, we announced that the port is powering our electricity needs with 100% clean power. If I turn to the supply chain and performance, it's been well documented that the international supply chain experienced stress in 2021 and 22, which impacted gateways to different degrees and in certain ports harmed exporters. The Port of Virginia was pleased to operate to a high level in this period. Our operating model was capable to deliver good service and adjust to many challenges. Overall, the international intermodal supply chain normalized across the nation in 2023. Dwell times for cargo reduced, resulting in lower yard utilizations, greater chassis availability, and now the opportunity to invest in capacity expansion within facilities. And international freight rates have reduced to close to pre-pandemic levels. Over the course of the last five years, the highest growth market for East Coast ports have been the Indian subcontinent Middle East and Southeast Asia, while Northeast Asia remains the largest trade lane by volume. These markets are served by the largest ships in the world, and this means improved navigation channels are required, stronger berths, crane capability, and modern operating ports. The work this committee is doing to pass the Water Resources Development Act this year is essential to maintaining US port competitiveness including a needed project modification for Norfolk Harbour and Channels. If I can turn to the international challenges of today, the Panama Canal first is experiencing a severe drought which has restricted vessel transits. Today, the acute need for transit means vessels must make their reserved slots and port operators need to ensure vessels depart on time. The canal is presently transiting 22 to 24 vessels per day compared to a normal 36 to 40. Vessel delays differ by operator the largest container vessels, users of the canal who historically reserve slots, may not be delayed, but others are experiencing severe delay or are paying to much higher transit fees to secure their slots. Water levels historically do not rise until June. Fortunately, better than expected November rainfall has not required the Panama Canal to further reduce. If I turn to the Red Sea, the recent attacks on merchant shipping in the Red Sea has resulted in most container vessels diverting to routes around Africa. Initially, this has disrupted schedules for Asian North Europe, Asia Mediterranean, and Asia East Coast services. The other impact has been a delay in return of container supply to Asia, which has in part contributed to supply constraints and an increase in freight rates on all trade lanes from Asia. Fuel prices have not increased. This is important because as shipping lines plan for around Africa voyages, the increased vessel and fuel costs can be offset by the decrease in Suez canals, this is particularly true for Southeast Asia to US East Coast services. It is not the same for Asia to North Europe or Asia to Mediterranean, where deviation and the European Union emissions trading systems increases void costs on longer voyages. What must be remembered is that vessels need to be sourced and positioned to fill in weekly schedules. This, along with increased at sea time for container box fleets, tightens the supply side of assets. This tightening of supply may be felt across global trade lanes as vessels and containers are repositioned to where they are most needed. Finally, protecting freedom of navigation in all waters is a requirement of fair, free and fair global trade. 
On behalf of the Port of Virginia and my colleagues, I recognize the extraordinary service of our men and women in the military who are active in the Red Sea, many of whom are, of course, deployed from our port. Thank you, and I'd be glad to answer questions the committee may have. Thank the gentleman. We'll now move to Mr. Roger Millar, Secretary of Transportation for the Washington State Department of Transportation. You are now recognized for up to five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Bowser and Ranking Member Larson for inviting me to testify today to discuss the state of transportation. Uh, my name is Roger Millar and I serve as Secretary of Transportation in Washington State. My remarks today will focus on how we're implementing funds through the bipartisan infrastructure law and summarize a few of the challenges we're experiencing, including those related to project cost escalation. I want to start by thanking the Congress for passing the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, which will provide over $5 billion in federal funding for Washington State over the life of the act. While the act only requires states to suballocate portions of three of the formula programs, in Washington we suballocate 41% of all of our federal aid formula funds to our local partners and then we work closely with them to support successful obligation of their federal funding. To date, we have used funding from the Act on more than 370 projects managed by WashDOT, including safety improvement projects, stormwater and culvert replacement projects, roadway preservation projects, and bridge preservation projects. As we deliver projects with funding from the Act, we strive to ensure that the projects benefit all Washingtonians, including being more inclusive in our contracting work. WashDOT is a national model for disadvantaged business enterprise participation, and for the federal fiscal year 2023, our DBE participation rate was nearly 19%, putting $111 million into that community. The National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, the Electric or Low Emitting Ferry Pilot Program, are two examples of new pro programs in the act that we are implementing. We are leveraging federal funds with state dollars for this important work increasing both the impact of federal funding and our ability to reach our decarbonization and efficiency goals. We also appreciate the new discretionary grant programs that support bridge large transformative projects through multi-year grant agreements and or funding pipelines. For example, WashDOT was recently notified that we will receive a $600 million mega grant award for the interstate re bridge replacement project. This project will replace the Interstate 5 bridge, which connects Washington and Oregon, and serves as a critical connection for regional, national, and international trade. Replacing this aging bridge with a crossing that can meet the needs of all travelers for generations to come is of the highest priority. Our implementation of programs in the Act are, is not without its challenges. For years, infrastructure investment did not keep pace with needs. The impacts of a lack of adequate investment to preserve, make safe, and enhance our systems for all users are readily apparent and will take time and hard work to overcome. Currently, WashDOT has less than half of the funding we need to keep our system in a state of good repair. Like DOTs across the country, we are experiencing cost escalation for some of our projects. The COVID pandemic placed an unprecedented strain on the supply chain, resulting in increased material costs. While we're no longer experiencing the same supply chain issues that we did in 2020 to 2022, workforce availability remains a challenge for the entire transportation sector and affects schedule, ultimately affecting overall project costs. DOTs, engineering consultants, labor, contractors, and suppliers are ramping up to deliver the programs funded through BIL, but a massive increase in projects requires a substantial workforce increase as well. We hope that through future reauthorizations, Congress will provide a robust and sustained level of funding as our federal partner so that everyone, especially our private sector partners, will invest to ramp up, keep up, and deliver on these vital projects. We also need to do more to encourage women, people of color, and other underrepresented groups to study and work in transportation engineering and the construction trades to help build the strong, diverse workforce our programs and projects require. Another challenge we're having is related to the process known as August redistribution. In the past, Washington has been very successful in obligating all of our federal funds and using the additional obligation authority that has come our way through the redistribution process. But our success means that we're reaching our contracting authority limits under the Act, which will decrease our capacity to continue to utilize the redistributed obligation authority, and we are not unique in that case. 
Uh, staff from AASHTO has been working with FHWA on suggestions for solutions to maximize highway formula dollars provided to state DOTs and are sharing those ideas with uh, Congress. Thank you again for the honor and opportunity to testify today. We appreciate having a strong federal partner. We're working diligently to use our federal funds to preserve and modernize our multimodal transportation system for all users. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Tucker, Mr. Jeff Tucker, CEO of the Tucker Company Worldwide. You are now recognized for up to five minutes. Chairman Rouser, uh, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the House TNI Committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today to highlight the vital role that logistics companies play in the supply chain and how our industry combines with an effective infrastructure to directly benefit the American economy. My name is Jeff Tucker. I'm third generation CEO of Tucker Company Worldwide based in Haddonfield, New Jersey, and former board chair of the Transportation Intermediaries Association. I have 33 years of experience in this industry and chair and co-chair committees in other national and international logistics associations. Tucker is the oldest privately held freight brokerage in the United States. We arrange some of the largest shipments that humans can move on the road, and we also move pharmaceuticals and other high-value goods. We've supported numerous presidential, military, and both the RNC and DNC national conventions with um, logistics support. I'm honored to represent TIA's more than 2,000 member firms. TIA is the professional organization of the $232 billion third-party logistics industry, and it's an association that my father, Bill, co-founded in 1978. Logistics companies like mine view infrastructure as the chessboard, the chessboard upon which we use every single mode of transport to literally make the world go round. We are innovators. We're huge investors in technology. We are mode agnostic, and like you, we are focused on ensuring goods reach consumers quickly, safely, and efficiently. The work logistics companies do has taken on new importance since, um, in America since the pandemic upended global supply chains. Freight supported rapidly shifting supply chains, anything like, unlike anything in history. From mid-2022 to mid-2023, we seem to have reached a new equilibrium as the other gentlemen have mentioned. The pandemic era, era disruption in freight has dissipated and the broader economy is proving resilient. We believe these factors combined will create greater stability in 2024. Our industry overcame the historic challenges to keep America's supply chain fluid. I commend the administration and this committee for the proactive approaches to addressing supply chain concerns, notably through the Flow Initiative and the creation of the Supply Chain Task Force. Thank you for the bipartisan infrastructure law to continued and robust investment in infrastructure combined with resourceful and innovative logistics companies like mine are part of America's superpowers and directly improve our economy, jobs, and the health and welfare of our people. Our number one challenge is fraud. Fraud is rampant in trucking. It is ballooned to an $800 million problem. There's a surge of malicious actors engaging in illegal activity, registering with FMCSA as carriers and perpetrating fraud, theft, and holding freight hostage in situations without any legal consequences. While this is obviously an economic problem, hurting consumers and businesses alike, it also raises safety and security concerns. Unfortunately, FMCSA is failing to enforce the law investigating tens of thousands of fraud complaints lodged with it. We see similar cases of fraud with dispatch services, which are often based abroad, operating here in our country, who, mind you, are not required by FMCSA to obtain a license or a registration like my company has, doing essentially the same work. We need FMCSA to step up. FMCSA must stop dabbling in non-safety commercial considerations, like what dollar amount a performance bond should be or what commercial terms included inside a private contract between two parties um, uh, exist. Instead, focus on safety. Other issues impacting the industry, for example, there's a rising need for longer-term investment at the Mexican border to meet the increased truck and rail traffic crossing that border as supply chains shift closer to home. State regulatory issues, which may be well-intentioned, 
often dealing with sustainability and air quality, are causing more challenges in the nation's supply chains by creating more than one standard for interstate commerce. Finally, there is no driver shortage. I shall that, say that again. There is no driver shortage, nor has there been one. That is a false narrative that may lead to unintended consolidation in the industry and a weakening of American supply chain. A doubling of more than doubling of the number of carriers and an increase of one million drivers uh, has occurred over the last year, uh, 10 years. We must have a more nuanced conversation about this and other policies, and I'm thankful to be here and, and look forward to further discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Ms. Lauren Benford, controller for the Ryman Corporation. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Reisler, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on this vitally important topic. My name is Lauren Benford, and I am the controller of Ryman Corp, an active member of AGC, and the past president of the AGC of Wyoming. AGC is a leading associate in the construction industry, representing more than 27,000 firms, including America's leading general contractors and specialty contracting firms, many of which are small businesses. Ryman Corp is a 76-year-old family-owned company currently passing um, leadership off to the third generation. We employ 150 employees and operate in Wyoming, Nebraska, and Northern Colorado. We specialize in heavy highways, civil, and commercial construction. In my testimony today, I will discuss the status of construction industry, including the challenges that lie ahead for rebuilding our nation's infrastructure. For construction industry, managing inflation defined 2023. Since February of 2020, the average cost of construction material has increased by 37%, nearly twice as high as the consumer inflation, which was seven, or 19 during the same amount of time. More specifically, highway construction costs has increased 50% since December of 2020, According to the Federal Highway Administration, these figures also reflect a significant cost increase for specific construction materials from February 2020 to November 2023, which include a 113 increase in the price of diesel, 60% increase in the price of steel mill products, 40% increase in the price of gypsum, which is used in many of building materials, and 31% increase in the price of cement. The price of fuel, especially diesel, has driven up the cost of the construction industry and projects nationwide. Higher diesel costs means construction companies must pay more to operate equipment, deliver material to jobs, and haul away debris, dirt, and equipment. Likewise, construction workers themselves feel the pain of higher commuting costs, particularly for jobs in, rural, in areas like Wyoming, where workers often have longer commutes. Wyoming is uh, working in Wyoming creates many challenges being a rural state, such as ma material availability, severe shortage of skilled laborers, extreme we weather, shorter building seasons, and logistical challenges because of long distances between communities. The construction industry labor shortage remains severe, with the most, most construction firms expecting labor conditions to re remain tight, despite, firm, despite firms increasing pay and benefits, the workforce shortage continues. In 2023, AGC survey found that 93% of construction firms reported they have open positions they're trying to fill. Of those positions, 90% are having trouble filling at least some of those positions, particularly among the craft workforce that are performing the bulk of the construction work on site. Nevertheless, confusion around the Buy America requirements have added to the uncertainty. While AGC supports the effort to enhance Americans' manufacturing capabilities, there remains confusion among suppliers, contractors, and owners themselves, including the DOTs. It is also important that we depoliticize the Buy America waiver process. If a waiver is granted, it does not mean that America or administration, Democrat or Republican, does not care about domestic manufacturing or American jobs. It means that they also care about American construction jobs and want to rebuild Americans' infrastructure. Looking ahead to 2024, construction companies have a mixed outlook as expectations for demand remain mostly positive, but less upbeat than last year in these new challenges. The Infrastructure Investment and Job Act provided mar market opportunities for all types of construction companies. From a construction standpoint, AGC members report that most of the IIJ funding to date has not has been um, needed to, re to repair and uh, repave our roadways. 
While AGC members are hard at work to rebuild the nation's infrastructure, it's also critical to recognize that current focus on repair and reconstruction is in its early stages of the IIJA is partly due to project readiness. Well, we have not seen an increase in the large projects to bid. As a result of the IIJA, we remain optimistic the robust funding levels provided in the law will mean more construction projects break ground in the next few years. If Congress did not pass the IIJA, the impacts of, on transportation contractors would have been significant, with likely a cut of 20 to 30 percent in projects by the states. I want to thank you all for the opportunity uh, to testify today. I look forward to any questions. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Benford, and uh, thank you to each uh, for your testimony. We now turn to questions from the panel. <clears throat> I will recognize myself uh, for five minutes for questions. And as usual, I have more questions than there is time, so I'll try to uh, shoot through this. Um, for each of you, uh, the attacks on the cargo vessels in the Red Sea and the ripple effect on the uh, global supply chain, what impacts have you noted in your industry since the beginning of these attacks, uh, Mr. Edwards? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, the, initial, the initial impact is <clears throat> the um, delay in vessels arriving, both in Asia and coming back to the United States and the redeployment of ships to cover those slots elsewhere. So international ocean carriers are rescheduling all of their ships right, and coming around Africa. There is a short-term effect to that as everybody replaces ships into the schedule. It will settle into a pattern of ships being in a longer transit. And in the case of Southeast Asia to East Coast, that will be probably seven days in each direction of a, long, of a longer transit. It is, of course, more acute for exporting into the Middle East or exporting into um, the Indian subcontinent. Um, and with that scarcity of supply of assets is undoubtedly going to come some higher prices to users of, the ocean, of those ocean carrier services. So I think we should also recognize that the fastest growth in trade in the last few years has been the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia as people have moved to an Alt-Asia um, supply base. So it is challenging one of the most highest growth areas within our trade. So that extra seven days, does that equate to 20 percent in extra costs, 30 percent, 10 percent? And do you have a round, roundabout figure? I do not. The extra, the actual time, the act, depending on the individual circumstances, you can take the view on current fuel prices that the extra seven days can be offset by the loss of the Suez Canal fees. That is not true for Asia Mediterranean or um, Asia North Europe. And of course, the scarcity of assets, I have to, you would have to ask the ocean carrier on an individual basis. Some can fill those gaps, some cannot. Mr. Millar, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, Mr. Chair, it's an emerging issue that has yet to impact us, but we're certainly tracking it, and our concern is cost escalation. Mr. Tucker? Mr. Chair, uh, another association that I represent is in a, a, a committee chair is the National Industrial Transportation League, and I uh, spoke to uh, uh, the league uh, yesterday about this and that it is uh, a concern uh, because of the, the long time it takes uh, to, to, to move around Africa, if that's the, the direction you're going. Uh, the other concern is uh, that uh, there are special uh, fees that are being granted, uh, the ocean liners by uh, the FMC, and um, uh, the, there is just some concern uh, among shippers that uh, maybe those uh, fees are um, not always applicable to the situation. And uh, nothing specific that they can necessarily point to, but there's a concern there that would love um, a little bit of oversight and explanation around. Ms. Binford? I would echo Secretary uh, Millar's words that this is something that we will um, be watching when the supply chain does have disruptions. We will usually um, see effects of it, but at this time we, we are not. So as the committee begins to develop the next proposal to reauthorize our nation's surface transportation programs, uh, can each of you provide a few priorities, let's say uh, one or two, uh, that this committee should consider to ensure infrastructure investments contribute to the overall economic development, safety, and prosperity of the country? Uh, Mr. Edwards, I'll start back with you. I'm um, certainly, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask first that you move forward on the Water Resources Development Act, in particular for the navigation of channels. That is critical to most ports. I would say that there are just about every coastal port has some dredging requirements going forward. And we in particular have some requirements within the um, Water Resource Development Act for, for some authorizations as well. So that would be uh, the first one. I think the second one that I would take is really just to allow the bipartisan infrastructure law to be acted on quickly 
is areas where we need to modernize, in particular on NEPA, and in particular with the Maritime Administration, where, by example, the Maritime Administration has not updated its categorical exclusion since 1985. There's a need for modernization. Uh, real quickly, Mr. Millar. Uh, safety, sir. Safety, safety, safety. The combined budgets of the 52 DOTs in the United States is about $200 billion a year. Crashes cost our economy $1.4 trillion a year, seven times the combined budgets of all the DOTs. If you're going to invest in something that would pay a return to the economy in the reauthorization, I would strongly suggest safety. Mr. Tucker and Ms. Binford, I've got about 30 seconds. Echo uh, echoes the uh, Secretary's uh, response, except with regard to fraud, and uh, really this committee encouraging FMCSA to work on safety, 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 and less on commercial terms. Ms. Benford? I would say uh, maintain the formula funding to sustain flexibility for our states to utilize funds um, in the best way that they need. Thank you very much. Mr. Larson, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and sort of following on that uh, last question from the Chair, um, I want to start with a kind of basic question. Is it too early to start thinking about the next infrastructure bill, uh, Secretary Millar? Uh, Mr. Larson, I started thinking about the bill the moment the President signed the last bill. And, uh, <laughs> Give us so time, it, man. It, 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 it is not too late to start thinking about too early. authorization. <laughs> You know, we're fortunate that the Congress, in its wisdom, has a multi-year authorization in the transportation space, but the ramping up for a sustained level of investment requires more than five years. It requires, you know, it takes generations. Uh, we're asking contractors to invest in equipment. We're asking consulting firms to staff up and, and buy materials and the like knowing that there's going to be a robust and sustained level of federal commitment in the transportation space enables us to do our job better and more efficiently for the people we serve. We've had that issue every time we've tried to do reauthorization. I'm glad we were able to do it. Um, but perhaps, uh, Ms. Penford, you can talk a little bit about your comment with regards to uh, this is not a quote, but I'll just try to paraphrase. We are just now starting to be able to invest as contractors in the longer term in the re in the in the rebuild as opposed to just the repair. Right. So currently, a lot of these projects are um, in design. Right. So we haven't seen a lot of them come out to bid, um, and so we're really expecting that this will hit us in the next year as contractors to bid these this work, and then we'll, it'll be a five to six year process for us to complete this work. I think it's important, no, it's not too soon to start thinking about another bill because, um, as Secretary mentioned, uh, we are working really hard to ramp up our workforce, and there is a lot of excitement in our industry right now um, as they see that there is a sustainable uh, amount of work for them to com complete, and so I think it would be beneficial to, to let the workforce know that it, it's a long-term game, not just this next five to ten years. Yeah, I know when this is signed, uh, the President said this is a once in a generation opportunity. I, I like to think like this is a pretty boring once every five to six year opportunity that we just routine, routine, uh, routinely do as opposed to every generation. So hopefully we can get, get to that um, get to that point. Um, Mr. Tucker, from a from a supply chain perspective, how would you characterize the BIL and sp like specific areas that are perhaps where the TIA is, is looking at? Sure, I I, um, I hesitate to sound like a broken record, but again, some of the some of the issues with repetition is not a bad thing. It, yeah, it, yeah. It takes so, us a while to absorb what you all are hearing, and hearing it over and over again is a good thing. Uh, a former administrator, uh, uh, N. Farrow, uh, appointed me once to a committee helping FMCSA, so I got to really know and appreciate. And one of my good industry friends is a former administrator of FMCSA, so I got to know and like and appreciate the the people there. But I, I think from time to time, you know, as what happens in Washington, they get clouded by lots of different ideas that may or may not be important or relevant to safety. So that's a, that's a concern. But specific to your question and specific to infrastructure, uh, I, I, I will tell you that what we're seeing is, and I don't know if, if any, how many members here have been to the border, um, to Laredo, the crossing. Uh, I've been there, I toured it, and it's, uh, it's a heck of a thing. But um, 
I, I'm here to tell you, too, that there's a tremendous amount of manufacturing being brought back to the Americas, in particular to, uh, to Mexico, due to all of our tensions with China, all of the concerns around uh, single point of failures with regard to critical uh, goods that we were only buying from China. So that crossing, uh, all of the Mexican crossings are going to be, uh, that's to uh, talk about a generational thing, that is happening right now. And um, we, we, we all know how much uh, freight came from China and the Far East. A lot more of it's gonna be coming through the borders. And of course we have security concerns there as well. As well. Th thanks, I would, I would note um, by Washington, you mean Washington DC and not the great state of Washington. Not the great state, no. Or we have no problems. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Edwards, have you mentioned Water Resource Development Act, and we're going to be moving on that fairly soon here. Uh, from a from a broader perspective, uh, how would you what would you want us to know about implement or uh, passing Word at 24? I, I think we asked the question about what next on bill on on, on from a funding perspective. I believe there's about $5.2 billion for ports within the, uh, within the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, that will be, that is more money than has ever gone into the port sector from the federal government. So this is a once in a this is a generational opportunity for ports to make their upgrades. I do believe that certain parts of that will have to continue over a significant amount of time, particularly as we look at energy hubs. Energy hubs is somewhat new in the port for a number of port sectors, and it will require multi-year, um, we're going to have to be pretty strict at sticking to the task to make those energy hubs work. That's great. Thanks. Thanks so much. I yield back. Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the, um, the Federal Highway Administration recently released a final rule to require states and metropolitan planning organizations to establish a new performance measure with declining targets for carbon dioxide emiss emissions attributed to the national highway system. It pursued that rule despite the fact that they didn't have the authority to do so. In fact, that was considered and rejected in IJA negotiations. Uh, further, Federal Highway Administration also rejected concerns about that issue from rural America. It seems like rural states where the largest cities are, by comparison, small towns, uh, you can't meaningfully reduce carbon emissions by building a subway or a bus rapid transit system to attempt to reduce commuter automobile traffic, even if it was affordable. I live in a town, biggest town in my district uh, is almost 80,000. That's a pretty small town um, by, by most people's definition, um, even though we have a Starbucks. Uh, we're still not a full-fledged metropolitan area. So my question is to, to Ms. Benford, do you feel this new regulation will impact your ability to deliver projects? Yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, I do, we do feel that the Federal Highway Administration um, uh, chose to treat each state, state as the same, and I will echo your words. I, from Wyoming, um, emissions uh, are a fraction of the amount of carbon dioxide emissions compared to more populated states that we produce. And so we are concerned uh, what that impact will be on um, our DOT, what, what projects they'll have to limit to try and meet those standards. Um, same for us, uh, we don't have subways. Um, bike paths between our communities would be hundreds of miles. And with the, the weather, extreme weather that we have, um, just an example from Cheyenne to Laramie, uh, 45 miles, and you could leave Cheyenne at a 70 degree temperature, go over the pass, and it could be, you know, 30 degrees and snowing. So, a bike path in these types of communities would not would not be relevant. So, I think you answered my question in your comments there. But let me let me ask this: Are you concerned the administration will actually use this rule as a roundabout way to influence project selection? Yes. Yeah. That's my concern as well. Um, I want to I want to stay with you for just a second here. Um, Ms. Benford, I, the administration is requiring project labor agreements, and we're hearing about that from, from contractors, um, the potential for slowing down the construction pro process and so on. Can you talk about how that may be impacting your ability to sure. get things so, done? So I am aware that um, PLL, PL, PLAs are um, being impacted. We, we do not do federal, um, direct federal contract work, so it's not something that is um, impacting us currently. Broadly speaking, is that an issue that affects uh, your membership? Yes. And how so? 
I think people are concerned um, about how it will affect uh, the way that they do work um, and limit the, the way they do work. Uh, not long ago, Secretary Buttigieg was uh, testifying before this committee. I made a point of asking him about the glacially slow pace of awarding grants. Earlier this month, Eno Transportation published a story highlighting that issue. It read in part, quote, while new appropriations and new grant selection pr press releases have gone up, the rate at which USDOT and selectees have been able to negotiate and execute grant agreements has actually gone down, end quote. One culprit seems to be the increased construction costs, essentially because grant application processes take such, uh, so much time, a project often ends up costing more than the original projection by the time a sponsor learns that it's actually been selected for a grant. Um, I think that's very concerning when we consider how inflation has driven up construction costs. In your experience, Ms. Benford, have you noticed a delay in DOT's rollout of its grant programs? So Wyoming actually doesn't get to participate in a lot of the discretionary grants because we actually struggle to match the federal funding. Um, currently, our local AG chapters are working with our state legislature to uh, increase our funding. funding. Um, but So that's not something that we, we get to utilize as much as we would like. So in the state of Wyoming, you're kind of behind the eight ball simply because you don't have the population that can fund the match required to participate in some of those grant programs. I get that. But let me ask you this. How has inflation impacted construction costs, generally speaking? I would say that it really hasn't. Um, right now, we haven't seen the work. Again, this is a five-year kind of rollout. So inflation really hasn't impacted uh, the IIJA. It has impacted the work and the cost of the work. And that's just something that you have to pay attention to. You have to be planning. You have to schedule to make sure that your materials are on site um, and and roll out the project as, as bid. Thank you. Yield back. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a, a question for... Uh, uh, Ms. Benford and uh, Secretary Millar, uh, a common theme of today's testimony is the need for more workers to build and maintain the projects funded by the Infrastructure and Inf uh, uh, Investment and Jobs Act. I appreciate it. Mr. Uh, Millar's testimony regarding the growing participation of disadvantaged business enterprises in Washington State and Ms. Benford's discussion of her efforts to teach young students about construction sector career uh, opportunities. Throughout my service in Congress, I have worked to increase workforce development opportunities for District of Columbia residents including helping to establish an opportunity center at St. Elizabeth's in Ward 8 of the District of Columbia and to help residents get jobs and apprenticeships at the development of Homeland Security Headquarters Consolidation Project. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act included significant workforce policy changes uh, including reinstating local hire authority, <clears throat> allowing highway formula funds to be used for workforce development and dedicating funds from every zero emission bus grant for worker training. Uh, Mr. Millar and Ms. Bedford as well, beyond what we have done in the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, what else should the committee be doing to support workforce development? Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Norton. Um, in Washington State, we have a robust pre-apprenticeship support services program that we're funding with state revenue today. Would love to use federal revenue in that space, but we, we, we have more flexibility with our state revenue. We're working with community colleges, we're working with ministerial alliances, we're working with Native American tribes, we're working with labor unions, we're working with contractors on getting people into the construction workforce. And uh, that pre-apprenticeship support services work we do, the, the one I am most proud of right now is something we did called Youth Direct, 
where we partnered with the Iron Workers Union. We took young men and women who were aging out of juvenile justice and foster care. They turned 18. They would typically go out on the street. When they turned 18, these men and women came into our pre-apprenticeship support services program, and after four weeks, they graduated on Friday. On Monday, they were apprentice iron workers, and we provided them with first and last month's rent and security deposits, so they had a good paying job and a place to live. It cost us about $2,500 per individual, $2,500 per individual to run them through that program, uh, which we got a little criticism for. And I like to point out to the critics that that's a lot less than it costs to be a guest of our Department of Corrections on an annual basis. So we know what we need to do. We need more and more flexible resources uh, to do more work in that space. It's, it's helping those individuals and it's providing critical staffing for our contractors, for our maintenance crews at our agency uh, and elsewhere in the construction sector. Ms. Benford? As a woman in this industry, the diversity topic is very dear to me. Um, I can tell you that both the AGC and local chapters have taken on um, different uh, ways to take on this, this challenge. The culture of care is one that the AGC of America has taken on, which really helps us contractors um, determine how to create an environment in the construction industry that everyone feels accepted. Um, and I think keep echoing that this is something that we need to do, right? And, and make sure that what you can all do for us is make sure that we have the flexibility to do what is right in our state because not one um, policy fits every single state and, and our workforce. Uh, Mr. Millar, uh, we're in the early stages of a transition to zero emission vehicles. Um, this past summer, the National Capital Region's Transit Agency uh, received a $104 million grant from this Jobs Act. Mr. Millard, what additional actions should Congress take to smooth the transition to zero emission vehicles? Uh, Ms. Norton, I, I think the actions you've taken in the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, just sustaining that is the important thing to do. Um, we are seeing more uh, electric vehicle charging stations being installed. We're working with the uh, trucking industry on uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. We're creating uh, corridors, working with our colleagues in Oregon and Washington. We're creating, we have a zero emission vehicle corridor on the Interstate 5 corridor. We're putting a heavy truck corridor in, in place uh, in, in addition to that. So it's sustaining the effort over multiple acts is what's going to do it for us. The gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. West Webster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this topical hearing uh, as we head into the new year. It's great. Um, currently, most of the major infrastructure uh, funds are invested in projects not in the United States, outside the United States. Uh, the largest opportunity for infrastructure investment is in another country, globally, uh, not here. Uh, therefore, and that's because of uh, there are some regulatory issues, but also the fact we just don't have an infrastructure bank. And that's, uh, that's a shame. Consequently, the United States runs a risk of getting behind if we're not already falling maybe falling further behind um, and from our friends and our foes in the area of infrastructure. Uh, I, I, along with uh, Congressman Allred, filed a bill called H.R. 490, which is the infrastructure bank bill, and it would establish a federal infrastructure bank. Uh, the funds don't have anything to do with the federal government, state government, or local government. It's all private money, and it's privately financed, <coughs> nationally chartered, though. It's a wholesale bank, and uh, the funds could be used for infrastructure pro uh, projects with no cost to the taxpayer, which is just new. It's just an idea new. It's not the solution. It's just an idea of new money. It would uh, fund domestic projects that would otherwise not have been funded. Uh, we see as a See it as a fantastic opportunity to do something a little different, 
to take a lot of the money that's spent overseas and maybe bring it back to the United States uh, and, and make it a more competitive worldwide approach. Uh, Mrs. Benford, Ms. Benford, um, could your company, others like it, benefit from enhanced private investment of our national infrastructure dollars? Can you restate that question? Sorry. Um, could your company benefit from the investment of uh, new infrastructure, private infrastructure dollars? So we did benefit from the, the federal dollars. Pri yes, we, we also do benefit from private as um, we do a lot of commercial work and, and civil work in, in our community. Mr. Edwards, can you see the same thing in uh, ports? I, I believe, uh, Congressman, that in the, in the port sector, the source of funds on how we bond our money or how we leverage our, how we leverage our opportunities we're always welcoming another source of money if there's, a, if there's a lower cost of money. So it really will come down to the cost of money at the end of the day, um, because I wouldn't see it necessarily as a change of how we create our revenue stream, but more a case of how do we source money. Mr. Myler, do you have any comments about that? Uh, Congressman, I, I don't, do not know the specifics of your bill. Um, any new tools in the toolbox are welcome. Um, I often uh, look at the difference between financing and funding. Um, it's, it's one thing to have a good financing tool, but I need funding to make that financing tool work for me. Yes, well, I guess that's the uh, name of the game, right, <laughs> is the yes, money. Where's the money? Yes, sir. Yes. So, Mr. Tucker, you have any comments? Uh, Representative uh, Webster, I, you know, TIA is always um, looking for and open to new uh, ideas for increasing the spending and in investment. Uh, we feel, and while well, we're entirely grateful for the Infrastructure Act, we um, we would love to see more, more done. Yeah. I don't know the specifics of your bill, uh, like the Secretary, but um, we're always open for um, new and innovative ideas. Yes, well, the biggest difference is the infrastructure bill that we have now is our money, federal money, state money, and so forth. Uh, this bill would be private money, no no investment by the, any government entity, and no responsibility to finish a project that possibly couldn't be finished. And so it's a little bit different, but it is new money. Well, anyway, time's run out. Reel back. Gentleman yields back. Ms. Napolitano, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Secretary Miller, California and Washington are very similar in dealing with impacts of cross-state rail and truck traffic on local communities. My district specifically has some of the largest trucking and rail corridors in the country. Great crossing projects and projects that improve commuter experience with less interaction with trucks are very important in my community. How necessary are great crossing safety projects and commuter projects that address the combined truck corridors and can give examples of what Washington has done to improve the commuter experience in rail in the freight corridors and how effective have the federal great crossing elimination and freight programs been? What can be done better? Uh, thank you for that question, Congressman. Uh, freight logistics is hugely important to Washington State. We are a trade-centric uh, economy. Um, with the uh, ports of uh, Seattle and Tacoma and other ports and a lot of north-south truck and rail traffic, a lot of east-west truck and rail traffic. Um, the Great Crossing safety funding that we receive from the federal government is invested statewide in, in making our system safer. We have a great partner with our class ones with uh, Burlington Northern Union Pacific. Uh, we put together a grade crossing plan for the entire state. We identified the top 50 and we're funding them and, and getting those crossings uh, accommodated. Uh, we're also working on the issue of truck parking. Uh, with the, the new rules, the electronic logs and the like, we have truckers pulling over to the side of the road um, outside of our major urban areas looking for a place to 
to stop and take that mandatory break. We don't have enough places for them to park, and local governments are resistant to permitting additional places for truckers to park. So we are uh, identifying spaces in the public sector. We're talking with cities and counties and others about, in, including our ports and our, our shippers, about safe places to park. We actually had to pass a law in Washington state requiring receivers of freight to allow the truck drivers to use the restrooms in their facilities because they were not being allowed. Uh, we're entirely dependent on trucking to move goods and services in our communities, but we're not treating the truckers with the respect that they need to become a part of that community. Uh, we've worked with the University of Washington. We've applied a little AI and the like to a predictive truck parking model that can give a trucker uh, the likelihood of finding a parking space two to four hours in advance, and we're expanding that work. We have a grant application in partnering with the states of Oregon and California to look at a predictive truck parking model for the I-5 corridor. So there's a lot going on in that space. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, in your testimony, you discussed the importance of the federal government support to states for a national EV charging program. Washington, Oregon, and California are working collectively on the West Coast Electric Highway Program. Can you briefly discuss the program, how effective is the partnership, and how important it is to our local, state, and national transportation systems? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, the West Coast Electric Vehicle Highway Partnership has been in place for more than a decade now. Uh, it, it, it started with state investment and with NEVI. Now we have federal money going into that program as well. The three states have collaborated in that corridor on what our standards are, what the, the, the spacing is, how we invest public funding and leverage private funding to, to make that happen. Um, it is essentially in place along the, uh, the I-5 corridor from uh, Baja, California, all the way to British Columbia. And we're looking at other routes east-west off of that corridor, routes like, uh, you know, uh, 99 in California and and 101. Um, so that work is is advancing. Uh, we are working now on a heavy freight uh, equivalent of that, looking at both battery electric trucking, the Class 8 trucks, and the hydrogen fuel cells, being able to provide fueling for them. It's emerging, uh, but the federal funding that has come to us has greatly enabled us to advance uh, all of those agendas faster than we would be otherwise. Thank you for your answer. I yield back. Mr. Bost. Thanks, Chair. Mr. Tucker, um, just to put an explanation here, um, I and Mr. Collins are the two people that are uh, actually come from the industry. Uh, I was born and raised in a trucking business, and, and my uh, I came, tell people I came home from the Marine Corps. I ran it for 10 years. I loved it for eight. And uh, now my brother runs it. But we've heard from all over um, about increasing freight fraud, and you mentioned that in your testimony, and basically uh, inserted several times in your testimony. This is devastating to small, business, uh, small businesses and owner-operators as well. Losing out a few thousand dollars can actually put them out of business because they work on such a thin margin. Now, not only is it a huge problem for small carriers, but it also undermines trust and stability throughout the supply chain. Now, you mentioned uh, multiple types of frauds, but have you seen any action from FMCSA uh, to deter uh, put up a, or put up a stop to supply chain uh, straining and safety risk of raising freight fraud, or of rising freight fraud? And, and when I say that, they insert themselves into the line, and you may believe it's a decent broker that you're trying to work with, and you may be out somewhere and you're trying to get a backhaul or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you get the load, they get the money, and you can't find them. Do you see anything that's being done right now to try to deal with this in the industry? First of all, I, I, I heard your and uh, Representative Collins' backstory, and um, you're living the dream, so. <laughs> uh, uh, great question. Uh, n the short answer is no. But if I may clarify, please, um, the fraud, so I'm a freight brokerage. I'm not a carrier. The fraud I see is um, is is more, you know, if I wanted to simplify it, oversimplify it, I would say it's carrier fraud. It's fraud. It's but but it's it shouldn't be carrier fraud 
I, I really, it, this is really important, I think, for this committee to understand. It should never be seen as carrier fraud. It should not be seen as broker fraud. These are, these are just criminals. And now, I, I mentioned earlier in my testimony, too, that we move pharmaceuticals. These are multi-million dollar, one pallet of freight loads, right? Um, we know that criminal um, activity follows these trucks because they know where the drugs are made. They follow the trucks and they wait for uh, an opportunity. So this is the same kind of individual. It's the same, they're, they're just criminals. And they're utilizing FMCSA to, sh to, to maybe uh, uh, sign up as a brokerage. They're, maybe, they're signing up maybe as a carrier. So please don't, um, please, when we're thinking about this, really important to be thinking about it as criminals using government agencies to masquerade as someone else. And in some cases, they don't even use the agency. They just, they, um, they, they use a false address. Someone's real, they could use my address. Mm -hmm. And they could pretend to be someone that they, they shouldn't. One of the really important things, I, try, I, I go on the radio, I talk about this on road dog trucking. And um, one of the things that I talk about anytime I talk to an owner operator is there, there needs to be more education. I, my grandfather started his business with two retired people in an apartment building in New Jersey. And um, every single person from 1961 through today, we do credit checks on. We don't rely on a, you know, there's got to be some bond. There's got to be something protecting us. We do a credit check, and, and we turn away business that we can't afford to take on because we can't trust. So it's really important that you do all of your homework when you're in business, and uh, that's the longer answer. But FMCSA, no. They need to do way more to help us. Yeah, and the only other conversation I'd like to have with you, but, but we don't have time here, is I, you say there isn't trucker, or, uh, there isn't a um, driver shortage. If you're out there dealing with it every day, yeah, there is. And, and, and the question, I the only statement I would make towards that is, and I made it in this committee before, it doesn't help with all the states that are legalizing marijuana because what happens is we have a tremendous amount of people who might be good drivers, but they'd prefer to smoke dope on the weekend and they can't get clean by Monday. It's not like having a beer on Sunday during a football game. You can't, you pop positive for 30 days and then you're without that driver or, or you just don't, don't have that driver. But. Yeah, I, I, I think um, what I've been, I've been uh, fortunate enough to be getting and keeping data on, on the active for hire motor carriers uh, for 12 years now. And I'm one of the only organizations that publish this data on a regular basis. So there are over one more, one million more drivers than driving today than there were in 2011. There are um, more than two times as many. There are about approximately 350,000 motor carriers in business today, 148,000 in 2011. So generally speaking, there are uh, wicked driver shortages if you're a carrier of any large size, but it's because drivers uh, follow the American dream. J.B. Hunt was a driver. Now it's one of the largest tr trucking organizations. So there's a, a spirit of innovation in truck driving, and, um, and that's where drivers are going. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, listening to the testimony and the questions, I came to my mind, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Here we are. We find ourselves faced with $1.2 trillion to invest in infrastructure. And so the ports can't get it all done today, so there are some complaints, to be sure. Uh, the state's uh, trying to push the money out, and the contractor's faced with uh, a significant increase in uh, contracts available to them, so much so that the uh, various materials necessary to uh, build the systems become expensive. Demand. Oh, happy day. $1.2 trillion. Water Resources Development Act moving along. Job shortages? No. People to do the jobs? Not available? Happy day. People have an opportunity to get a job. There are programs to train people. Oh, happy day. It's in the legislation that's been passed. You think about what's happened over the last two years with legislation. Yes, we have implementation problems, no doubt about it. But those implementation problems are really the result of an enormous amount of federal investment that is available. For the ports, 
on the dock, in the water, dredging, rail lines, crossings, states, flush with money from the federal government to build the systems. But yes, there are implementation problems. And contractors faced with significant demand for the goods and the services to build the systems. Happy day. Yep. But there's still problems. I want to go into one of them. Uh, I see my colleague, Mr. Johnson, uh, has left at a most inopportune moment. Perhaps he'll return. Uh, but uh, two years ago, we worked on the uh, Ocean Shipping Reform Act. Ah, he's back. Hello, Mr. Johnson. I'm about to say good things about you and the new legislation that we have. Uh, Mr. Tucker, thank you so very much for bringing to our attention uh, the issue uh, of the implementation of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. Again, happy day. A major piece of legislation was passed, and now we have to update it. Um, I would appreciate if you could uh, comment. Well, I guess this is really to uh, the majority party. Mr. Uh, Johnson, I know you're pushing hard to get this bill off the floor so that we can put into the Coast Guard bill. So uh, let's see what we can do. Mr. Tucker, talk to us about the uh, implementation of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act and the next steps that are in the bill. And thank you very much for endorsing your organization, endorsing the bill. This is 1836. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll quote, um, uh, before I get too deep, I'll, I'll quote, um, uh, dirty Harry and saying a man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> uh, I am uh, far more a trucking uh, and surface transportation mind than uh, ocean. Um, uh, that said, I will I'll, I'll let you know that TIA supported uh, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act by uh, Congressman Garamendi and Congressman uh, Johnson. Uh, TIA members were hesitant about more government regulations, but welcomed um, the legislation text uh, about creating a, def a definition of unreasonable demurrage and detention fees and trying to reverse the trend of uh, a few ocean carriers using retaliatory practices against manufacturers and shippers. Um, these shipping laws have not been updated in more than 20 years. Um, also echo your oh happy days um, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the years and years and years of continuing resolution without vision. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Uh, Mr. Edwards, uh, our former chairman, Chairman DeFazio, after about 20, maybe almost 30 years, was finally able to take the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund and apply it for more than just the harbor itself, but also for the, uh, the port and the infrastructure associated with it. Uh, so I'm curious about the implementation of that Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund uh, and the uh, changes that occurred in WERDA 2020. The new WERDA is coming up. Do you have recommendations on how we might better implement the existing laws and changes in the WERDA, the new WERDA that we'd be dealing with. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I think, firstly, we were delighted when the changes came forward because as an we are an energy port, and therefore we can receive harbor maintenance tax dollars for the purpose of investing in our, in our hard infrastructure. Um, noting the time, what I would comment, I would be happy to come back to in writing, but also stay at this time. But the distribution of those funds, perhaps, is something we just need to free up a little bit um, so we can get that money to work, um, and we're ready to put it to work. I see my time has expired. Yield back. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Rouser. Uh, I talk a lot about ports and ocean shipping in this committee. Sometimes my colleagues are a little confused by that. Regrettably, South Dakota does not have any oceanfront property. Uh, but then when you look at uh, how globally connected we are, uh, little old South Dakota, we export more than $5 billion of agricultural products a year. More than 60% of our soybeans, for example, go overseas. Uh, manufacturing, uh, we export more than $2 billion a year. That is, uh, for a state of less than a million people, a lot. It's about $7,600 per person. And so, Mr. Edwards, it's certainly the case that what you do, what the other ports do, the whole global uh, shipping environment does have an impact on South Dakotans, as, as they do on every American. 
And so I want to pick up where Mr. Garamendi left off, uh, a product of this commi uh, committee, particularly of uh, Mr. Garamendi and myself, was the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. The Federal Maritime Commission has a couple of very important uh, rules promulgation efforts underway, uh, one on detention and demerge, uh, another on shipping exchanges. Uh, first, if you have any comments about those proceedings, I'd be happy to hear them. Uh, but other than that, um, if you have any other areas where you think some additional interest by Congress could improve uh, ocean shipping, uh, we're all ears. Uh, thank you, Congressman. What I, what I would say is soybeans, by the way, is the largest containerized export from the Port of Virginia as well, just not South Dakotan soybeans, as somebody else's soybeans. Um, what I will say on the, um, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act changes um, that were placed in, and in particular regarding the detention and demerge, we are an operating port, so we are, we are a marine terminal operator, uh, and we believe we operate well within the guidelines that are, that are laid out. Um, I did take time before I came here today to talk to some of the other trade coalitions, and I think the thing that is, the, the one item that I would ask Congress to do is hurry up the Federal Maritime Commission. Um, I think it is over a year, it was, I think their, their guidelines were due to be, come out in June of last year and were waiting now on the Federal Maritime Commission, and, and here we are in January. So I think the whole industry is saying, from top to bottom is saying, the whole industry wants to abide by what, that, what the intent of the legislation was. Could the Federal Maritime Commission please publish that guideline so that the whole industry can then ab abide by it? I, I would say that's the most important one on, on detention and demurrage. I believe on, on the balance of trading, um, and in particular on, on exports, I do believe, I, I am a true believer that the private sector normally reacts appropriately in the marketplace. There are times when that may not work so well. Um, and I think because as a political subdivision, we can take our own action to protect our exporters if, by example, imports were overwhelming the supply chain, which is what happened during the pandemic in 21 and 22, is where imports could overwhelm the pandemic and the exporter could have, could have been harmed. I think it is important that ports as a whole realize that we are, yes, a for-profit business and we reinvest our profits back in, but we're also a public utility in the sense that we have to provide that service to the exporter as well as the importer. And I, there is, on a port-by-port -port basis, that need to understand the balance of protecting capacities if one leg is particularly clogging up the system. So in that environment, is there an area that, that is particularly weak or, or worrisome to you over the course of, say, the next 10 years? I know a lot of ports are making a tremendous investment in additional technology to increase their capacity. Uh, I think people have a deeper understanding of their frailties uh, coming out of the pandemic. What, what worries you now? Um, I think as we, do, as we deploy technologies, and we will continue to deploy technologies, we can become smarter and smarter as, a, as an industry. I think the one thing the pandemic taught us is where do, you count, where do you put your surge capacity and who is reacting to that surge capacity? And ultimately, if you're going to carry redundancy, somebody normally pays for that redundancy. I do believe that you're seeing that, the reaction to that on a port-by-port -port basis across the nation. And I think it's fair to say that we would be fools if we didn't acknowledge that every port competes with every other port. We are natural competitors, so we are businesses. And therefore, it's in our own interest to be able to provide certain, um, you know, surge or redundant capacity as a whole. And I don't. My own take on that is that is my role as a port. I'm not yet. I'm not asking the government to intervene and tell me how to do that. Uh, Ms. Ben, uh, Benford, you noticed. Uh, you noted your company doesn't do direct federal work. You did mention that PLAs can be onerous and cumbersome. Is is that type of federal regulation? Is, is that what makes you, uh, at least in part? less likely to do direct federal work? Um, I, we're just not really set up to do direct mm -hmm. federal work. There's a lot of restrictions and a lot of expectations that we just don't meet as a small company. Um, and and there is not, we, we don't do the large jobs that would be um, required by a PLA. Very good, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> And uh, thank you, ranking member, uh, for holding this important hearing today. And thank you to the witnesses for your testimony. Since 2020, uh, when uh, Joe Biden was sworn in as president, Democrats have been hard at work doing our job and fulfilling our promises by successfully enacting and implementing historic levels of infrastructure investment to jumpstart the nation's economic competitiveness, protect the traveling public, 
and prioritize the creation of good paying jobs. Unemployment is low and wages are high. The stock market is up and America's economy is growing at the phenomenal rate of 4.9%. While individual number one was busy declaring every week to be an infrastructure week, lying to the American people of an infrastructure week that never materialized, Democrats were hard at work putting people over politics. And in 2021, House and Senate Democrats, along with a few Republicans, passed President Biden's $1.1 trillion Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the $1.7 trillion American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, the Inflation Reduction Act, and other notable pieces of legislation. And these important pieces of legislation are responsible for the job growth, wage growth, stock market growth, and strong economic growth that the nation enjoys today. Tomorrow, I will be reintroducing equally important legislation, the Stronger Communities Through Better Transit Act. This bill will provide greater transit equity and quality to communities across the country, including communities in rural areas. Also, it would create a new program to provide transit agencies with federal funding to increase and improve transit service, thereby leveling the playing field for our constituents who need transit to get to work, school, and to the doctor's office, and uh, or to the pharmacy. It's time to invest in the thousands of transit systems across the country to ensure that all Americans in cities, suburbs, and rural areas have access to frequent, high-quality, dependable transit. Now, uh, Ms. Benford, uh, as you stated in your testimony, disadvantaged business enterprises, uh, DBEs, play a pivotal role in fostering diversity and inclusion in the construction industry by ensuring that certified small businesses owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals can compete for federally funded highway, public transit, and airport projects. I was happy to hear that Associate, uh, excuse me, Associated General Contractors of America, which uh, you are representing supports aligning the DBE statutory size standard, which is currently capped at $28.4 million gross annual revenue, um, cap, um, aligning that with the $45 million cap, which is revised for industry trends and, infle and, and inflation at least every five years by the SBA. I re recently introduced H.R. 6820, which is the Small Business Contracting Fairness Act, which would amend the IIJA to raise the statutory size standards. Can you speak more to the importance of increasing this standard, and uh, uh, which would give DBEs greater access to transportation, Department of Transportation uh, projects? Yes, so I, we, we do appreciate that because I think that is one constraint that our DBEs are limited by. Um, we we uh, are required to use um, DBEs, and just to give you a little idea of what that looks like, when we bid a project, we have to solicit, so we have to reach out to 80 to 100 DBEs, um, and in Wyoming, we get one to five quotes. Um, and so I think um, giving DBEs um, more access um, when, whether it's the constraints or the administ um, administrative, requi administrative requirements that they're required to do would be helpful, yes. Thank you, uh, and I'm about out of, time, so out of time, so I will yield back. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Mann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. I represent the Big First District of Kansas, and as a geographic center of the country, Kansas offers excellent transportation advantages for, for certain industries. Over the last several years, there have been a number of regulatory proposals that have threatened to disrupt the nation's supply chains, um, creating undue burdens on American businesses and causing mass delays in the shipment of goods. Of course, the pandemic highlighted fractures in our supply chains, and, and in my view, instead of focusing on the issues, 
instead of focusing on the issues, the administration um, continues to focus on more regulations that will cause further bottlenecks and uncertainty for the nation's supply chains. Um, a handful of questions. Um, first for you, uh, Ms. Ms. Benford, um, in regards to the um, WOTUS or Waters of the U.S., the Biden administration continues to ignore the clear decision by the Supreme Court in the Sackett versus EPA case regarding the definition of waters of the U.S. under the Clean Water Act. What new uncertainty exists due to the administration's changes post Sackett, and did the navigable waters protection rule offer more or less clarity to you and, and to your members? Um, I'm going to have to circle back with you on that one. Um, anyone else have a comment on, on WOTUS, the waters of the U.S., and the impact that you're seeing that having to your, your particular industry? In Washington State, sir, um, 86 plus percent of the work that we do that's federally funded uh, is addressed through a categorical exclusion. Uh, we're spending our money on preservation of our existing infrastructure, and uh, those rules have had no impact on that work. Okay. When we do more complex projects and we get into a NEPA analysis, we, we, we go with the regulations that we have. We're working on several projects in that space, and uh, we recognize that NEPA is a decision-making process. It's not a box you check. Um, I'm all for getting to yes really quick. I'm also for getting to no really quick when somebody has a bad idea. Yep. Yeah. No, no thank you. The um, next question is for you, Mr. Tucker. Um, last month, the Customs and Border Patrol briefly suspended rail operations through international rail crossings in Eagle Pass and El Paso. I know you referenced um, earlier in a question about the importance of these crossings. You know, when the Customs and Border Patrol did that, when they had to move agents to other parts to help secure the border, Union Pacific Railroad alone noted they had more than 60 trains or ne nearly 4,500 rail cars that are being held south of the border. How do these type of delays and, and suspensions of, of cross-board activity affect supply chain and logistics throughout the country? What, what are the ripple effects of that in your view? The uh, ripple effects are significant, uh, and especially for uh, grains, right? things that have a, 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 an expiration, such as food. Uh, so those are, those are big ripple effects. Um, I am I'm not part of national security. I understand that there might have been a, 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 a impetus to um, make Mexico do more um, and uh, in doing that, but I think that the, the challenge needs, needs to be faced. We need to continue moving this freight. As I said earlier, there is way more freight moving um, north from Mexico and expect, please expect it to continue over the next decade. And uh, we, we just can't afford to have a closure like that. From what I understand, at least from the uh, figures released by uh, the Union Pacific and supported by uh, the AAR, is that it was about a $200 million impact. So I think you know, um, working with industry, um, letting industry know of potentials like this so that they can work around it, if possible, would help mitigate it but there really needs to be a better collaborative environment around um, stoppages such as yep, this. I, I completely agree. Um, last question, um, quickly for you, Ms. Benford. In your testimony, you detailed how the cost of construction had increased in the first quarter of 2023, of uh, the cost of highway construction had increased 53.8% over Q1 of 2020. Can you describe the impact of these increased costs on businesses like yours and your ability to complete projects? Yeah. So. Um, Again, going back to the bid process, when we get quotes from our subcontractors, we're really required to lock in immediately. Um, and so time is of the essence to make sure that the owner and everyone buys into the price. Um, because if if we don't, we, we the effects are risk, right? So we take on that inflation, our subcontractors take on our inflation. And um, ultimately, I can tell you that there's been a lot of, of subcontractors who struggle with this, right? If we don't, if we don't, tell them, yes, you've got the job, and they don't buy materials immediately, they, they are affected by it. Thank you all for being here, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Carberhall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Miller, last Congress, many of my colleagues and I worked on crafting landmark legislation to invest in our infrastructure, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and create good paying jobs. Through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the American Rescue Plan, and the Inflation Reduction Act, 
we have been able to do all three. However, I do understand that workforce availability is a challenge for the transportation sector. As we continue to oversee federal dollars from the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act hit the ground, what are some of the considerations this committee should take into consideration and account to ensure that we maximize our federal investments? Uh, Congressman, there are a lot of things on my list there. Uh, we are working right now in Washington State to bring more women and people of color into the construction trades. Uh, when we see uh, folks aging out of industry, um, it's important that we take advantage of every pool of, uh, of individuals available to us. Part of that is making the workplace a welcoming place uh, for everyone who's engaged. Part of that is providing the training. Part of that, frankly, is getting people interested in our work. And that's going to require us to get down to like the elementary and middle school level uh, on just the, the whole issue of math, science, uh, and technology. Uh, there are lots of folks. I, I go and speak at the University of Washington to graduating civil engineers, and they're not interested in the transportation space because it's I had a bunch of them say, I'm, my, my focus is on the environment. Why should I get into transportation? You talk to them a little bit and they figure that out, but we're, we're, we're not having those conversations. It's incumbent on industry to be reaching out. It's incumbent on our educational institutions to be reaching out. Uh, we need to get young people interested in and excited about the futures that exist in this space, uh, knowing that you can have a job with good pay and benefits and retirement and, and the like in the construction trades without a four-year college degree. Uh, people don't know that, don't get that. So I, I think there's an awful lot that we need to do in the education space. What we're able to do at the Washington State DOT with funding from the federal government and from our state legislature is directly engage with community colleges in Washington State, uh, with uh, church groups in Washington State, with labor unions in Washington State, with contractors in Washington State, with Native American tribes on getting the people that they care about, getting the people that they want to see succeed into the transportation space. So I, I would encourage the Congress, as you consider reauthorization, workforce is going to be huge. There needs to be resources there, but the, the resources need to be flexible. Uh, the way, uh, you know, we, we don't use federal money in our pre-apprenticeship support services work. We're doing things like buying tools for apprentices, buying boots. And uh, my Office of Equity and Civil Rights uh, lead says, when you use federal money, you can buy the boots, but you can't buy the laces. Because, you know, so uh, the funding is important, the flexibility is important, and just the, the acknowledgement of the scale of the problem. Thank you. Mr. Tucker, as a former chair of the Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation Subcommittee and now ranking member, I was able to work on advancing the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022, written by Representative Garamendi and Johnson. Can you discuss how the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022 is helping to alleviate the supply chain crisis? Uh, Congressman, thank you uh, for, for uh, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. I, um, I, as I said, I, I, um, I'm not the ideal candidate to speak to uh, ocean um, issues. However, uh, the TIA is um, extremely uh, appreciative and supportive, in particular for uh, you know creating definition around unreasonable demerge and detention fees, um, trying to reverse the trend of a few ocean carriers using retaliatory uh, practices against uh, manufacturers and shippers. So thank you for your support. You did a darn good job knowing the issue, though. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields, Ms. Chavez de Reamer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here today. I'm Lori Chavez de Reamer, new member of Congress representing Oregon. So, Secretary Millar, it's nice to be on the border with you. I am appreciative that you mentioned the I-5 
bridge and how important that is as, mm. as we move through. But my questions today, back in December, the Biden administration, the Council on Environmental Quality, as well as six sovereign nations released a final package of commitments in the ongoing Columbia River Systems Operation litigation and mediation. In this package, a myriad of provisions were included and general consensus among specific Northwest communities and stakeholders in the agreement is a de facto breaching of the dams. My Pacific Northwest colleagues, Congressman Newhouse and Congresswoman McMorris Rogers, and myself have been staunch supporters of the Lower Snake River dams and are deeply concerned about its future. Breaching the dams would be a fatal blow to the Pacific Northwest as the Lower Snake River dams provide immeasurable benefits to the region and the nation. For instance, the river system significantly decreases traffic congestion and pollution. It would take exactly 39,204 rail cars and 150,784 semi trucks to move the cargo that is barged through the Snake River by rail and truck. So, Mr. Millar, you mentioned in your testimony that the Washington State Department of Transportation works to maintain and improve local roads, railroads, and airports, which is an ongoing issue. Breaching the Lower Snake River dams would exacerbate this issue, would it not? Uh, Congresswoman, uh, Washington State in particular, Governor Jay Inslee, has not taken a position on breaching the Snake River dams. Uh, we are engaged with the other partners in their area on studying the potential impacts of that. We have just begun the study of the transportation impacts and our ability to respond to those impacts. So having just begun the study, I really can't speak to what those impacts might be. By adding a substantial amount of rail cars and trucks to railroads and highways, would your agency still be able to meet its objectives? Yes. The Lower Snake River dams play a significant role in not only providing clean, renewable hydropower energy, which provides my constituents with low-cost electricity, but also transporting approximately 60% of the nation's wheat exports. Mr. Millar, if the Lower Snake River dams were breached, how would this wheat alternatively be transported? Uh, again, no decision's been made, and the state of Washington has taken no position in that space. Uh, the, op the, 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 options, the options that uh, shippers have to barging would be by rail or by truck. If an alternative plan could not imminently be implemented, don't you think this would further negatively impact supply chain issues that would already be exacerbated by COVID-19? My guess is you're going to say the study is still out there, so no decision's been made. Um, but I would like to keep an eye on it and work with your office and, and make sure that we're paying attention to how this happens. The state of Washington is partnering with other uh, entities that are interested and involved in that uh, particular issue, including the state of Oregon. We welcome the continued communication. Well, I appreciate uh, the support for the Pacific Northwest, and I'm glad that you're here today. Thanks. I yield back. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Ranking Member, for hosting the hearing today. In recent years, our transportation systems have been undergoing a transformation from the COVID-19 pandemic, which stunted many transportation sectors, to the historic IIJA funding, which renewed investment in modern infrastructure. In the Chicago area alone, we received grant funding through IIJA to make transit more accessible improve commuter rail infrastructure, and deliver over 50 clean school buses to Chicago public schools, reimagining a modern, resilient, and sustainable transportation sector will require us to examine our workforce. In 2022, I introduced the Giving Disadvantaged Business Opportunities for Success Act, which would strengthen opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses. I'm glad that DOT is finalizing a rule that would allow more businesses to qualify as DBEs. Ms. Benford, uh, how, how would increasing the DBE network cap and streamlining the certification process benefit the construction industry and the larger transportation industry? Thank you. As I mentioned before, DBEs are a big part of um, our program. We are required to use them. Um, Wyoming, we, we have a lot of people registered as DBEs, but again, as when we bid go through the bid process, we only get one to five bidders. So um, anything that can ease the process for a DBE 
would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, continuing on the topic of uh, workforce, uh, your testimony uh, mentions challenges recruiting sufficient workforce to keep up with the demand of infrastructure projects. Has Washington State DOT identified the factors contributing to hiring challenges, and how have you approached a solution to this workforce gap? Congressman, yes, we, we have identified some issues. Uh, uh, wages are an issue. Wages are going up in the private sector. We're not seeing the, uh, the comparable increases in the public sector. Uh, they're somewhat restricted. Um, the availability of people, it's a competitive environment. You know, in, in my organization, I have hundreds of snowplow operators. They're out there very busy as we speak. All of them have a commercial driver's license, and I am competing with the private sector. I'm competing with cities and counties and port districts. I lost a whole bunch of uh, heavy freight mechanics uh, just a couple years ago to uh, the folks down at Hanford, uh, the federal government participating in the cleanup. They were paying more than us. So uh, pay is an issue for us. Um, the credentialing in the marine industry, we run the largest uh, ferry fleet in the United States, about 24 million passengers a year, and we operate 21 boats uh, up to a, a boat that carries uh, three that carry 202 vehicles and 2,500 people. Uh, the crew on those boats, uh, to apply for a job, you have to have a transportation worker's ID card, which requires a background check, which takes time and money that people don't have when they're looking for work. So uh, we, we, we do a lot in that space to provide um, better educations. We're, again, reaching out to high schools, maritime academies, getting young people involved and stepping up and getting that credential so that when a job becomes available, we can, we can move them to it. Uh, we've had to move training in-house. I used to hire people with the CDL. Now we hire people and train them on our dime. Um, in the marine industry, to advance in uh, Washington State Ferries, you used to have to take all of the training on your own time, and you had to pay for it yourself. We're, we've brought that in-house as a way to bring uh, people in. Our pre-apprenticeship support services, we're seeing more and more women and people of color there. We require on all of our contracts a minimum of 15% of the labor hours that are worked be worked by apprentices. Uh, we achieve that goal. And of those apprentice hours, 45% of those hours are worked by women and people of color. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, as you have stated in your remarks this morning, it's important that we be inclusive uh, and especially mindful of those who have uh, been left out uh, of these job opportunities. What do you think Congress needs to do to ensure that recruiting is inclusive and diverse? And you've got about five seconds. You know, I, I believe the statute is in place. It can always be improved. Uh, from my perspective, it's the application of that statute by people of goodwill that makes a difference. We, in Washington State, uh, approximately 77% of Washington State, they it, um, uh, consider themselves to be white. They, they identify as white. So about 23% of our community is people of color. At the Washington State DOT, when I came on board, 10% of the workforce were people of color. We've been able to raise it in the last three years from 10% to 15%, and we, we continue to work on that. It, it the, the rules, the laws are in place. It's the application of those laws over time that's gonna make a difference. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence. Yield back. Gentlemen, this time has expired. Mr. Collins, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Millar, I was out in Washington. We had that field hearing on those four dams that uh, Biden administration wants to tear down with a 98.5% success rate on moving fish up and down that ladder. And I can tell you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that when you're going to move 8% of the state of Washington's electric grid off of those hydroelectric dams that operate 24-7 and put them on some sort of Green New Deal, it's not going to work. Also, you're just going to increase the price of the goods that flow up and down that river by putting them on the trucks, and I'm in the trucking industry, don't get me wrong, I love trucking, but there's not enough trucks out there. There is a trucking shortage. So it's just a more proof that the Biden administration enjoys putting more inflation on the backs of the American people without any regards to anything other than them pushing a socialistic agenda. That being said, um, 
want to move in. My background is trucking, trucking industry. I'm a, I'm, I'm a business owner. My wife and I uh, are in the trucking business. I'm actually second generation in the trucking industry. Third generation is actually running our company now. You know, and, and, and uh, I started out at the age of 12, very much like Mr. Tucker, I'm, I'm sure, and I got my commercial driver's license at the age of 18. I still have those commercial driver's license in my back pocket. And, you know, I truly believe that the trucking industry is the most taxed and regulated industry in this country. For far too long, we have been the recipient of overreaching, overburdensome, and over out of control federal agencies. Mr. Tucker, I, I heard you say uh, that you are uh, a generational company, and I was just curious, uh, what, uh, what generation are you? I'm third generation. Is the fourth uh, generation working there? Uh, the fourth generation is uh, four children between the ages of 14 and 22, and uh, no, uh, no, not, not as of yet, no. I'll tell you something, the, uh, the trucking industry, once it's in your blood, it's in your blood. That's why it's generational. And, and like you, I was worried and am worried that the next generation doesn't have the opportunities to start a trucking company like I did. It's a very proud industry. We're proud of what we do. And yes, we are an extremely important part of the supply chain. And, and Mr. Tucker, I heard you mention uh, J.B. Hunt. I want to tell you something. 98% of the trucking companies out there, y'all, 98% are 10 trucks or less. 95% are five trucks or less. So the trucking company that you reference, that and all the others that you make and call to your head, y'all, they only make up 2% of the trucking industry. These are mom and pop generational industries. So right now, whether it's hours of service, minimum age requirements, Barriers to entry by making us go to school, accessory equipment that's being mandated that didn't even be proven that it works, parking issues like the secretary mentioned. You know, Mr. Secretary, the reason we have parking issues is because we didn't have that five to ten years ago. But your shippers and your receivers have been sued so many times that they don't want anybody on their yards. We used to park wherever we were shipping or wherever we were receiving just to help with the hours of service so that we didn't have to drive there. But now, since there's such a Sioux crazy environment out there, nobody wants to take that general liability on. So they make us park elsewhere, which is why you see parking up and down the road. The question is, what do we need in the trucking industry? And you're right, Mr. Tucker, we need DOT to quit being a revenue generating agency and be out there and being safety driven, just like the FMCSA. You're exactly right in brokerage. There's a lot of thieves out there, the thugs. That's, that's the best word for them. They're not trucking. But y'all, we need tort reform in this country. Tort reform will solve the workforce issues, the parking issues. It'll, it'll solve the workers' comp issues, the health insurance issues. It'll solve all of our issue problems. Auto liability. They've done study after study after study and it has been proven that between 75% to 91% of the time when a four-wheeler is involved with a, in an accident with an 18-wheeler, it's the four-wheeler's fault, not the 18-wheelers. We don't need to force larger minimums on our auto liabilities in this country for trucking. The only thing that does, Mr. Chairman, is gives a pay raise to these trial lawyers out there. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for speaking on this important topic today. It has been a big year for transportation across the country as we have rolled out the bipartisan infrastructure law in my home state of Arizona. We have 609 new road and bridge project commitments using IAJA funds. $170 million was awarded through 12 grants to my state, and we received $466 million in federal reimbursements for ongoing transportation work. But what do those funds mean? What is the actual impact? For the Arizona Department of Transportation, who has received more than 35 million of those discretionary funds, they've been able to begin a huge range of projects from a wildlife crossing pilot to cut down on vehicle 
collisions to improve habitat connectivity, safeguarding our wildlife, to project planning for our Phoenix and Tucson passenger rail to keep our communities connected. Our federal work has spurred local and state investment as well. ADOT pushed hard to complete 24 critical pavement preservation projects in 2023, repaving and restoring more than 300 miles of highway. All of this is good news and showcasing that the State Department of Transportation is stronger than it was before the historic investment of the bipartisan infrastructure law. For all the progress we've made, we still have unfinished work to do. Arizona's top infrastructure priority, my top infrastructure priority, is the expansion of Interstate 10. I-10 connects Arizona's two largest cities, Phoenix and Tucson, and tens of thousands of people commute along it every day but it's more than a commuter route. I-10 is a key commercial artery for freight traffic to and from the ports in Southern California and for international commerce with our largest trading partner, Mexico. Despite the critical importance of I-10 in the state, for 26 miles along the Gila River Indian community, it is only two lanes. Any Arizonan who has driven this stretch will tell you that is not enough. The congestion and traffic are horrible and it is a safety hazard. A single crash can back up this highway for many miles. Even standard rush hour traffic causes significant backups in this corridor that would be averted with a third lane in both directions. The state of Arizona has applied for a infra grant under the bipartisan infrastructure law. My team and I worked with ADOT to make it as competitive as possible. And it is my hope and expectation that this project will move forward very soon. And I'm glad to see the Transportation Intermediaries, Intermediaries Association and the AGC here today. And I'd like to talk to both of you about the importance of supply chains. Mr. Tucker, a large focus of your testimony on behalf of the TIA was on the supply chains and the importance of freight as part of that equation. Can you speak about the impacts that congestion has on supply chains and the importance of investment in projects like the I-10 expansion? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I, I would agree with your assessment uh, with regard to uh, I-10, and I don't think that um, enough Americans understand the, that, that we have ports that um, go through land, right, our land crossings, essentially. Uh, and um, I think that we will begin understanding that a lot more. As I've said numerous times and in my written and oral testimony so far, um, Mexican freight traffic will continue and is only going to grow. And we really have to tackle that, right? So anything that represents a bottleneck, such as what you've described, and there are others, um, but clearly uh, you've, got a, you've got a key one there in Arizona. Um, anything that, uh, that, that slows that down, it increases costs to, to consumers. It increases costs to, um, uh, to, to the retailers who pass it on to the consumers. And, uh, and especially with regard to uh, things that may spoil, such as food. These are, um, you know, we have, and I think we should really appreciate it, and I don't think we always do, because we're always talking here about what's needed in infrastructure. We have the greatest delivery system in the world, this country, and we just need continued investment um, and continued collaboration, bipartisan work in this committee. This is a wonderful committee, and I. I Thank you guys for being on it. Thanks to all of you. Uh, but we've got work to do. Thank you. Yeah. And I should note that Mexico is not, not only the number one trading partner of Arizona, but now it is the number one trading partner of the entire United States of America. Ms. Benford, maybe the same question. Um, can you, how commercial arteries like I-10 play a better a role in bettering supply chain costs so we can improve I-10? So in Wyoming, we have a similar artery, I-80, that goes through our state that um, I would just echo what Ms. Tucker said. It, it's very vital that, that these supply chains are um, dependable and that we can get what we need on time so that we don't delay our projects. I appreciate those great answers. And with that, I yield back. Mr. LaMalfa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a quick one for uh, Secretary Miller. I guess in your position up in Washington, that makes you king of the road, huh? Yeah. Okay, I did it. So. I've heard that before, sir. I know you have. I have. Probably, probably half the people here don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so threw it out there. Um, I, would, <laughs> I share I-5 with you in the northern part of my state in, in California as well, and I just wanted to 
ask you, what is the price of that bridge you're talking about over the Columbia? Is that right? That's correct. Uh, somewhere between six and seven and a half billion dollars, sir. Okay. We're, uh, we're have a discussion on I-5 uh, just north of Reading there. Uh, the Pitt River Bridge is, you know, sometime within 20 years might need to look. So anyway, thank you for that. Um, I want to come back to uh, Mr. Tucker here on talking about California Air Resources Board and um, how individual states are causing things to not be very seamless with inter excuse me seamless with interstate commerce and the regulations um, as you know CARB and California are always trying to push some new envelope on uh, in this case 100% of the new trucks that be sold have to be zero emission by 2045 and they believe that's going to be electrification so far so um, we're just worried about that on supply chain, as well as California has huge ports in the Bay Area and Southern California. So, so much comes from Asia st straight in to those ports, and they have their own challenges with regulations. And yet so much of the demand is right there locally in a high population like California. So what I'm driving at here is we have CARB regulations and we have other states playing monkey see, monkey do on it as well. I just saw a piece this morning where Virginia's might be wanting to backtrack on their idea of electrifying all their cars by 2035 and what California's doing. So um, on top of all that, Mr. Trucker, how do you, what do you see as a prediction on large companies or all companies that will, in responding to California regs? You know, it used to be the, the attitude when I was in state legislature uh, some of my colleagues on the other side say, like, well, we're too apart, important of a market for them to not do what we do. Well, when, when, does, that, when does that finally drop off? And they say, no, we're, we're not going to play to that. We're going to play the other states that want to play, play fair ball. Will they continue importing and exporting out of California, or will they divert the traffic to Texas or some other, uh, some other port, some other method? We, uh, Congressman, we see these kinds of dis business decisions being made by motor carriers all the time in our industry. Again, we're dealing with thousands of motor carriers through 63 years. So, for example, in some, you know, I'm from New Jersey, so sometimes uh, motor carriers see the Hudson River um, separating New Jersey and New York as as the end of the con the continent, uh, and will not go uh, to there. And, and California has risen to that um, um, that level of profile where the drivers and, and carriers oftentimes don't want to go to California because they're afraid, right? One of the things that is, you know, I mentioned the, the, the bipartisanship in this committee. Um, President Carter was a Democrat. Carter started the deregulation in, in, in trucking. President Reagan, a Republican, continued that on. This committee has done tremendous work, this Congress, um, way back when, saw that one of the powers, again, one of the superpowers that this country has is, is how, do we, how do we make things um, faster, more effective, and safely get to the consumers? And, and um, I, I have that, to ask you to be, be brief, please. Pardon me? Be, be brief, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I think that uh, in, in the sh in long and the short of it is we've got to be thinking about these things. We've got to keep these front of mind. Sorry. Well, I mean, you know, in, in one set of regulations is becoming just a turnoff, and so they're going to squeeze a balloon, it's going to go somewhere else, you know? You, so. you, you can't, we saw this, we, saw, we see this, the, uh, the Americans, uh, we saw this as, as a way to distrib, d deliver interstate commerce effectively, but if we have a patchwork of, of rules in every different state that ca carriers have to try to figure out how to, how to uh, manipulate, you're yeah. not, okay. you're going to Thank you. Mr. Edwards, can you touch on that from the Virginia standpoint, please? Certainly, I'll be happy to touch on it from the port's perspective. I think the most important the most important factor we have in the movement of freight is that we plan freight accord that we plan freight on a national basis. We have to recognise that trucking as an industry can move from state to state, just as ships can move from port to port around around the globe. Um, what we do know at this point in time is that it is it would be simply impossible to have frontline operating capacity. Um, capable of meeting some of the standards that are being proposed, and that is essentially going to put costs into California. All right. Thank you. Time's already up. Thank you, Mr. Carmel. <clears throat> you back. Mr. Menendez. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses, especially Mr. Tucker from my home state of New Jersey. It's good to have you. Um, New Jersey's 8th Congressional District, which I have the honor of representing, has received almost $11 billion in critical investments from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act alone. These dollars are going towards improvements at the Bayonne Dry Dock. They're electrifying ferries and going towards the Gateway Program, the largest infrastructure project in the entire country, something that we are incredibly proud of uh, and we're just getting started. Uh, Mr. Millar, I want to talk to you because there's a series of questions that um, I think your experience would lend important insight to. Um, you talked about the cost escalations and one of the component pieces of it being workforce. And your testimony, you talk about several state-funded internships and pre-apprenticeship support service programs that Washington operates. What's been the most successful program that you've seen uh, increases engagement um, in workforce development? Uh, it, it's a suite of programs, Congressman. The, uh, the requirement to have apprentices work on our jobs, um, our pre-apprenticeship support services program where we're funding community colleges, labor unions, and the like to bring people into the construction trades. Uh, we've, we've taken that whole suite. I've had conversations with uh, Secretary Buttigieg and the US DOT uh, about what we're doing as perhaps a model for some of the adjustments that could be made in the, the, the national space. I appreciate that. I was on the phone this morning with a major uh, labor organization out of New Jersey having this conversation and what we can do to uh, encourage people. I think you said in your testimony today, it, that means going into grade schools and elementary schools and high schools and, and availing themselves of the opportunities that exist in the trades in engineering. And it's going to be an important part of our future as we continue to ensure that we have that we lead in infrastructure here in this country. Um, I have a second question for you. Um, we've seen it in New Jersey and the, the greater region in terms of changes in um, what work schedules look like and the impact that those shifts have had on public transit agencies and the funding that they receive from daily tolls that now people have adjusted to work from home um, and less consistent travel to and from work, which has impacted the revenues at a lot of public agencies. Wondering what your experience has been in Washington and partnering with local transit agencies. Uh, we have partnered with local transit agencies uh, from the get-go. We are a major funder of our more rural, smaller agencies and we partner with uh, King County Metro Sound Transit, the big ones in the Seattle area. What we're seeing uh, on our highways is the total volumes haven't changed, but the time of day yeah. has. What we're seeing in public transportation, what we're seeing on the Washington State Ferries is that people who can work from home, who choose to work from home, are changing their travel patterns. And they're, they're not, they're not uh, traveling during the peak hour. So how do we as service providers adjust our schedules to meet the, the needs of the community as the community adjusts theirs? Um, that's, that's an important thing, particularly for the large transit. For the smaller transits in Washington State, my experience is uh, you know 25% of Washingtonians don't drive. That's almost 2 million people. And as our population ages, more and more people are hanging up their car keys for the last time. So whether you're in rural Washington or suburban Washington, how do you maintain your independence, your dignity, and your quality of life without the ability to drive a car? That's public transportation, and those are investments we're making in very, very rural places right up to the downtown in Seattle. Yeah, absolutely, and continue to ensure that we're leading in public transit because there is a movement to uh, be less reliant on cars, which is something that we all want to encourage. So I appreciate your work there. Just a quick question on ferry electrification. Um, we've seen it in New Jersey where we're supporting uh, several entities in the district that are looking to move their fleet to uh, an electric fleet. What are some of the successes and challenges you've seen having one of the largest ferry operations in the country? Uh, the, the largest. The largest. Yeah, but yes, uh, it, it has been a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, we're currently converting one of our largest boats to a diesel electric hybrid. There's been a lot of people concerned about the cost of that. That boat's 30 years old. We launched it 30 years ago. We're trying to get 60 years out of it. It's in for a, an overhaul right now, an overhaul that was scheduled day one when we launched it. But rather than uh, replacing all four of the diesel motors, we're replacing two and we're putting batteries in. That comes at an increased cost, but over the life of that boat, we're gonna save $60 million of the people of Washington's. 
So telling the story has been difficult. Um, getting power to the dock yeah. has been difficult. Um, you know, and we're uh, with our partners and with federal support, uh, we're making that happen. Well, no monopoly on a good idea, so look forward to partnering with you, and I yield back. Thank you so much. Mr. Stauber. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate the comments by our witnesses today. Many of you have praised IIJA. <clears throat> but what I think you really are praising is the idea of IIJA. You know, we all want good infrastructure. We want, uh, we know the infrastructure projects means good union jobs and economic prosperity for our communities. The idea was dangled in front of the American people by the Biden administration as a prize to be won, knowing full well the bill needed a lot of work. For instance, rural roads definition in the IIJA is 200,000 or less. That means in the entire state of Minnesota, which is rural, only Minneapolis and St. Paul wouldn't qualify for rural roads grants. To me, that's unconscionable. See, without meaningful change in the spending habits of this country, inflation continues to soar higher and higher, eating away every last dollar that was promised to our communities. Without domestically sourced critical minerals and metals, our infrastructure projects are endlessly delayed as they remain at the whim of adversarial nations who control the supply chain. Without Buy America provisions, which this administration is actively trying to remove from the legislation, we rely, on, we rely on the biggest polluters and human rights abusers over American workers. Without meaningful permitting reform, many of the infrastructure projects fail to even get shovels in the ground. I am very disappointed that my Republican colleagues and I were not allowed to give input in the IIJA. Maybe we could have helped make it a, a better a piece of legislation. Mr. Miller, uh, you had mentioned uh, uh, EVs. Do you recall how much uh, the IIJA has invested in EV charging stations? In our state, uh, Congressman, $76 million in formula o funds. O overall? I don't Se know. $7.4 billion. It's been over two years since the legislation has been acted. Do you know how many uh, EV charging stations have been placed around this country? with that uh, investment, that money? I know the first ones were placed in Ohio. I know in Washington State, we have yet to use federal money to place some chargers, but we have been- You're exactly right. One in London, Ohio. Mm -hmm. One. $7.4 billion. One in London, Ohio. And the same administration is trying to remove the Buy American provisions for EV chargers. You know why? because they don't want to domestically mine. They would rather uh, enter into agreements with uh, the Congo, where 15 of the 19 industrial mines are controlled by the communist country of China, who use child slave labor. The district that I represent, Northeast Minnesota, has the biggest copper nickel find in the world. Union labor and this administration just pulled the leases for purely political reasons. They want to remove Buy America provisions so that they can get these minerals for the EV charging stations on the backs of children. No environmental standard, zero labor standards. Mr. Tucker, can you share the vulnerabilities you have seen with our supply chain, particularly in our over-reliance on China? Uh, Congressman, what was the last part of that? Can you share vulnerabilities you have seen with our supply chain, particularly in our over-reliance on China? Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I think it's a great question. I've long been concerned about, um, you know, um, not necessarily losing a war without a, a shot being fired, but we, we, um, we, we realized during the pandemic and in the, the months and years uh, the pandemic was playing itself out that there were critical um, supply chain items I've got uh, I've got healthcare customers who uh, made um, parts of syringes overseas only, right? Critical life-saving uh, devices. So I think it's really important, right, that we've got the flow initiative. I think that's very important. I think the supply chain uh, uh, task force is very important, and I think this committee's o oversight and this committee's involvement is is really important. And I think, Mr. Tucker, you're exactly right. I mean, we've learned a lot through COVID, right? We can't rely on adversarial nations. Uh, 
for our necessities, and, and one of them is critical minerals. The Assistant Secretary of the Department of Energy and Defense both said if China stopped selling us our critical minerals, uh, it would be dangerous to this country. And yet we have an administration that is trying to remove the Buy America provisions in the IIJA so they can get to their charging stations. They're putting my union uh, friends and neighbors out of work in northeast of Minnesota. We've been mining there for 145 years. Cleanest water in our entire state. Frustrated. Now yield back. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my concern today is that America cannot face uh, another supply chain shock like we've seen over the last uh, three plus years. Uh, it has uh, damaged our economy, it's uh, damaged workers, and um, we've invested a heck of a lot of money through the IJA. Uh, the Chips and Science Act, uh, there's provisions in the NDAA, all of these things that we've done to uh, shore up our supply chain and the infrastructure that supports it. Um, the supply chain shocks were caused by a number of things. Uh, the COVID policies of uh, the lockdowns and shutting down businesses and identifying which were critical businesses and which weren't uh, and the uh, how that flowed through our economy. There was a shift in demand. Uh, suddenly we needed uh, unusual amounts of PPE. Uh, we had people working from home. Uh, huge demand for yoga pants, not for me personally, but uh, there was uh, a big shift in demand uh, caused by COVID. And then we had really irresponsible levels of stimulus uh, by the Biden administration that shifted uh, consumer uh, habits and consumption patterns in ways that created an artificial scarcity uh, through all of that stimulus. And there's things that we can't anticipate, uh, like the ever given ship uh, that blocked the Suez Canal for, uh, for several months and uh, causing this cascade. We're seeing an echo of that with the Houthis and the Red Sea, uh, changing supply lines, uh, forcing ships to take longer routes it's not just ships taking longer routes. All of those ships uh, are carrying inventory. And if the route is longer, that means more inventory is needed and is at sea. And it has an effect when it arrives in port and when perhaps they all arrive at the same time and we end up with the enormous backlogs like we saw uh, you know, off of Long Beach, for example. Um, my hope is in a very brief conversation with you that we can try to just get a pulse of how things are going. Uh, the things that I'm excited about is reshoring of some of our manufacturing, certainly short shortening the supply chains. The CHIPS Act is critical uh, in how that flows through, you know, particularly for uh, chip production in the United States and in my district uh, for Micron. Um, but if I may ask, um, particularly um, Mr. Tucker, if I can start with you, uh, are you seeing a shift in a way from uh, just-in-time manufacturing uh, and maybe some of the inventories that companies are carrying or shift in your, uh, you know, in the trucking industry of what's being moved and where that you think is perhaps encouraging about the state of the supply chain. Could you give an insight from your perspective of the trucking industry? Uh, uh, yes, sir. I think that um, during the worst of COVID, uh, during the worst, excuse me, of the pandemic, I think companies were uh, stocking a little bit extra inventory, but the holy grail in retail is to throughput in, and not to have in inventory. It's of costs, course. and it adds costs to our, our... So I think that what I see uh, today is along the lines of what has been already said in other testimony, that the supply, the global supply chain, including our supply chain, has normalized or uh, normalized is no such thing as normal anymore, but e it reached equilibrium and um, one that is a far more predictable, uh, at least with uh, accepting you know, global uh, issues like the Houthis and, and the Red Sea. Well, there's I, shocks that we can't anticipate. I think that's, that's part of uh, what we're trying to avoid and what a lot of this investment has gone to. Um, Mr. Edwards, can I actually focus this, the same question to you? Are you seeing changes in um, what's passing through your port in terms of where it's coming from, how long it's uh, takes to clear and, and uh, what the throughput is? Is there, is there a encouraging signs there? Uh, Congressman, very encouraging signs. The fluidity of all ports is much better than it was in the days of the pandemic. 
So the dwell time of cargo is considerably lower, which tells you that the supply chain beyond the ports is, is all working well. And I do believe that a number of ports, ourselves included, are making large investments to allow for surges, shocks, et cetera. So I think the best, the best operating ports are running exceptionally well. There is undoubtedly some sourcing away from China. You can see that in the fastest growth, for example, would be India or Vietnam, would be significant growth engines in international trade that may have been sourced from China. It's before. a shift, shift away from China. Yes. I think that's critical. I just have a few seconds. In fact, my time's expired. So thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Arkenclaus. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to build off something that uh, Ms. Benford talked about at the beginning of this hearing regarding flexibility for, for states. Um, I would take that a step further and say that, in fact, we need an entire overhaul of how we do transportation funding. Uh, we've got to free our infrastructure from the grip of big oil and car-centric planning by handing highway funding and administration entirely over to the states and redirecting the federal gas tax to support uh, more bottoms-up initiatives. The Highway Trust Fund is running such a massive de deficit that the gas tax couldn't meet its needs even if it were five times higher. And what is doled out is allocated without reference to the metrics that matter most, like how well projects connect people to jobs, services, and one another. The driving metric is simply more vehicle miles. And to the detriment of state budgets, the federal transportation system incentivizes states to build road after road without regard to future costs of maintenance, operation, and environmental impact. The solution to this is not tweaks to the gas tax or tweaks to transportation funding, it's devolution. Congress should leave highway taxation and spending entirely to the states and commensurately remove federal, federal red tape and regulations on highways beyond a minimum standard of safety so that states and cities can use their dollars to address local mobility with organic solutions. Federal gas tax should remain, but be used instead to subsidize locally sponsored projects that promote walkability, micromobility, and transit. This is going to have three beneficial impacts. First, it will give states and cities more latitude that will encourage local innovation and help us find better trans transportation solutions. Second, it will compel an honest accounting of the cost of car-centric infrastructure. I heard this uh, during this testimony as well from Secretary Millar um, about the, the safety impacts. Uh, I would hazard that we can spend as much money as we want. We can match the full $1.4 trillion that accidents cost us in funding the Departments of Transportation, but if we continue to build car-centric infrastructure, we're going to continue to get car accidents. And more tragically to the point, we're going to continue to kill pedestrians, which the United States is doing at an alarming and increasing rate. And finally, uh, a transparent account of the cost of maintenance of highways will make it more likely that states implement strategies like congestion pricing and improved alternative mobility options like cycling lanes, rail, and on-demand transit. This transition will be disruptive to politicians and bureaucrats, but the net effect will be a low, lower carbon footprint, better mobility, and more walkable downtowns. Uh, and Chairman, I'd like to introduce to the record, submit to the record, rather, the, uh, the op-ed I wrote to this effect for strong towns. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Millar, if you were free as Secretary of Transportation uh, from federal regulations and the federal funding umbilical cord for highways, and instead you had to maintain your own highways uh, with state-generated funds, and to think about transportation from first principles in your state, how might things change? Uh, Mr. Congressman, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> prior to COVID, federal funding was 15% of the budget of the Washington State DOT. Uh, it's currently about 30% of our budget, but it's, it's, it is a, a fraction, a very important and very, very uh, welcome uh, and appreciated fraction. But uh, what I, there are two things I don't do as Secretary of Transportation in Washington State. I don't appropriate the money and I don't set policy. That's done by our state legislature. Um, our state legislature in the 23-25 biennium has invested uh, $406 million in public transportation, invested $150 million in active transportation, invested substantially in uh, uh, decarbonizing our fleet. Uh, we're working with transit agencies across the, across the state on decarbonization. Uh, if there's one thing I could do, and I've asked the legislature to consider this as they move forward, 
we have about 1,100 miles of highway, state highway in Washington State that go through population centers. Not the limited access freeways, but the, you, you mentioned strong towns, the Strodes. The, the roads. You're a strong towns I am leader. familiar with strong towns, yes. That's terrific. Um, we uh, have recommended a safety program, a competitive grant program, specifically for state highways that go through population centers because we're trying to move people through those spaces while providing access to those spaces at the same time. And the need for pedestrian and, and bicycle and automobile safety investment is huge because the fatality rates on those highways are twice the state average. Yes. The serious injury rates on those highways are three times the state's average. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's going to persist for so long as the federal government continues to incentivize car-centric um, highway infrastructure as opposed to empowering states to connect people to jobs and services through the multitude of modalities, walking, cycling, uh, micromobility. Um, we need to let the states run their transportation systems and not be subsidizing uh, automobiles. Yield back. Ms. Malloy. First of all, thank you all for being here. This has been a long hearing. Um, I had to leave and come back, and you've been here the whole time, so I appreciate your stamina. Um, Ms. Benford, I want to build on something you talked about. Um, when you were talking about how the states need flexibility and every state's not the same, you mentioned Wyoming and, and the long distances people have to travel along stretches of highway. I represent Utah, and we have similar problems, and in some parts of my district, similar weather. Uh, <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to put in a shameless plug here. I have a bipartisan bicameral bill called the Moore DOT Grants Act that would help address some of the problems you talked about with states being unable to meet the matching requirements for some of these grants, um, particularly in rural areas and rural areas with a lot of public land where they don't have the tax base to come up with the matching, but they have the same need to maintain roads. Um, so for your associates who are struggling with this in rural areas, have them look into the bill and talk to their representatives. Um, but I agree that states need flexibility. Um, not all states are the same. One of the things that I think applies to everybody, and I, I want to hear from everyone on the panel about this that you talked about, Ms. Benford, is um, CEQ and the slow permitting reform. Uh, permitting reform is one of the things I love to talk about. I think there are a lot of things we could do that would not be environmentally harmful at all, but that would save the taxpayers a lot of time and money um, in process. So I just want to go down the panel starting at this end and work to the other end. What Permitting reforms would be helpful to you that wouldn't harm any of our environmental protections, but would make things move faster so that we're keeping up with inflation and the costs of building these projects. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I would agree that the, the CEQ did have good, um, implemented a few permitting efficiencies, and I think that that's important that we, we take those to heart, like um, setting, de setting deadlines, page limits, um, and making sure that we we actually answer the questions um, in a timely manner so that the projects um, can proceed. Uh, again, I talk a lot about you know collaboration, and that's a big piece of it. Making sure that all of our partners are collaborating and and meeting their deadlines so that we can continue forward with our work. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Congresswoman, if you, if if you may, if I may, can I pass my uh, baton here to the secretary first? Sure. Thank you, Congresswoman. I, I think what we need first and foremost is adequate funding of federal resource agencies so that they're staffed appropriately uh, to respond to the regulations that they're charged with. What I find quite often is not the regulation that's slowing us down, is that there's nobody there to review the data and get the report done and get the work taken care of. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the, the rules are the rules. But what slows me down is when I don't, I, we actually, as a DOT, we provide our funding to resource agencies so that they can staff and, and do the work they need to do for us. If they were funded and staffed appropriately, I think you'd see things move a lot faster. I've seen the same problem in projects that I've worked on, and I, I appreciate the answer. I would submit that if the permitting regulations weren't so onerous, we wouldn't require as much staffing time um, and so we could solve that problem on both ends. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I think on the maritime space, as I mentioned earlier, not so much directly permitting, but improving the NEPA process, not to avoid the NEPA process in any state, but to modernize it. And in particular with the Maritime Administration to, to modernize, which hasn't, to my understanding, on certain exclusions happened since 1985. Okay, thank you. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Ms. Shelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much to each of our witnesses for being here today and for your important testimony. Well, my colleagues are rightfully concerned about the cost uh, and the impacts of inflation on infrastructure spending. I believe it gives us all the more reason to utilize IIJ and IRA uh, dollars that have been set aside, which uh, the funding here provides once-in-a-generation infrastructure investments. This past year alone, my district has been awarded grant funding for airport infrastructure, pipeline safety, and railroad improvements, just to name a few. Mr. Miller, you mentioned that workforce availability is a huge challenge. Uh, we know it all too well in my district, uh, across several industries uh, across the country, uh, are facing uh, incredible challenges recruiting and maintaining a qualified workforce. That's why I introduced the Honoring Vocational Education Act, a bill that would include vocational education under the category of post-secondary education in the United States Census. You mentioned that Washington State has several state-funded internships and pre-apprenticeship programs. Does the state utilize grant funds for those programs, and do you think those programs have scalability to the federal level? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I, I, I'm hoping that once in a generation turns to first for this generation and that we see a continuing level of a robust funding support from the, the federal government. The, the work that we do with state funding, when, when we look at the federal money that comes into our state, we apply it as efficiently and as effectively as we can, and we find the most efficient and effective place to spend that money is on preservation work. So we, we tend to put the federal money into the preservation work, and then we use state funding for the other things that we do, because quite often uh, bringing federal funding into some of those more complex activities uh, there are too many strings attached to it. It becomes awkward for us. Uh, we do have a robust uh, pre-apprenticeship support services program, on-the-job training program, uh, welcoming workplace program. We're working with the AGC. We have a capacity-building mentorship program where we're bringing disadvantaged businesses into the transportation space. Um, all of those programs uh, we have discussed with our federal partners and we are in conversations right now uh, with USDOT on, on how do you uh, make those projects and programs that can be done efficiently and effectively in the federal space. Because uh, some of my partners around the country, you know, I, again, I was president of AASHTO until uh, November of this year, of last year, rather. Um, a lot of my partners don't have the advantages that I have in Washington State in terms of the robust state funding. And so federal funding is, is quite often the only resource that's available to them. Thank you so much. Um, my next question is, is for anyone. As we continue uh, to face the, the very real prospect of another continuing resolution here in Congress, one thing, uh, you know, certainly budget talks divide us on opposite sides of the aisle, but one thing that unites us around this is I think that we can all agree a continuing resolution is no way to appropriate long term. Uh, can you talk about the impacts of uh, failing to pass full appropriations on, on state budgets? It, it impacts us when continuing resolutions, it's not the full funding, um, and it provides this uncertainty. It's, it's very difficult to plan and program when you have uncertainty in the mix. So um, fund it, I guess, would be, you know, the, the, the nice thing about the transportation space is, is through the, invest, the, the IIJA, you've made the, the big policy call. So it, it just needs to be funded from our perspective. Congresswoman, from, from my perspective, what I would say is on the actual appropriation of dollars, because we are largely working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, once they are funded, they are funded. So they are not subject to restriction of a continuing resolution. 
living in Hampton Roads, I am very conscious that I live with a large military set of neighbors and a large Coast Guard, and they clearly can have their, their services impacted, as can the uh, CBP, and in particular, making sure that all of, if those services are not working, ports and gateways will be restricted. Exactly. Thank you. Yield back. Mr. D. Esposito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tucker, since the uh, Biden border crisis began, it has been true that every state is now a border state, every town a border town, every city a border city. However, it seems that this is becoming more true every day and that every American, including my constituents, thousands of miles from the southern border, are truly feeling the effects of our open, porous borders. Recently, the CBP briefly suspended rail operations through international rail crossings in Eagle Pass and El Paso, Texas, which led to delays in the movement of goods. The Union Pacific Railroad noted that more than 60 trains or nearly 4,500 cars were being held south of our border. If I could just ask, how does this delay in suspension affect the supply chain overall? Uh, the, uh, Congressman, the, this stoppage was um, unannounced. It was fairly surprise to industry, right? Uh, at the same time, you know, photos and videos uh, show a, a, a true humanitarian crisis happening um, with deaths of uh, children and, and, and others falling from these trains, right? So really, I, I'm just glad that I'm not in charge at the moment. But um, uh, those are, who are in charge need to work more closely with industry. Um, those in charge need to uh, collaborate with industry uh, so that we uh, in industry have the opportunity to uh, circumvent um, a, an event like that or prevent an event like that or find other ways to, um, uh, to achieve the same outcome. Well, I think lack of communication and surprises are a, a highlight of this administration. So in addition to addressing the supply chain overall, how does decisions, bad decisions like these and lack of communication, how does that affect logistic industries throughout this country and companies like your own? Well, I think that um, you, uh, our industry is used to um, disruptions, so it's just another day, unfortunately. Um, however, that's not a good answer. That's not a good answer for our customers or consumers or the American uh, citizens. So again, I, I just underscore the importance of, of collaborating um, with industry. Um, we're here to, to we're here to help. I think we, we've got really open minds and 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 the ability to do just about anything. I think as we as we've proven um, through the pandemic. So uh, uh, communication, clarity, and collaboration, so important. And now, we, we've seen the negative effects of the border crisis throughout this country, whether it is uh, increased crime, whether it's the inability of, of sanctuary cities to make sure that they can provide to be that sanctuary, whether it's um, you know, what we've seen, uh, influx of, of migrants into communities that don't have the ability uh, to care for them, what other effects has the border crisis uh, have you seen negatively impact the supply chain or businesses like yours? Um, consistent with the theme of a lot of my written and oral communication or a testimony, the, um, the border is increasingly becoming, from a freight standpoint, the border is increasingly becoming a, a, uh, a bottleneck right, to the flow of goods. The good news is we won't have to wait a couple weeks for um, a lot of our products to come from China. We can, uh, we can ship them up by train, we can ship them up by truck, uh, or we can create them in our own country, which is also happening, right? Which is, which is wonderful to see. Um, so I think um, making sure that we invest in, that, um, in, in those thoroughfares and that they keep moving is important. And I know that you mentioned in your, in your testimony, we, we briefly touched on fraud. Uh, and you mentioned that these were bad people, and, and you said that fraud is a growing problem in the supply chain, costing nearly $1 billion uh, for American consumers. You also mentioned how the Federal Motor Freight Safety Administration has fallen short on enforcing laws or investigation complaints, often leading to malicious actors not facing 
consequences. Uh, what are the most common types of fraud that you're seeing in your industry? We see um, bad actors, just flat out criminals, masquerading as a trucking company, accepting loads as a trucking company, pretending with the same address, same area code because you can buy them for cheap, and, and, and making it look almost like you're the motor carrier. We see that. We see, we see bad actors pretending to be brokers, um, offering loads. Uh, we see um, part of two different organ freight crime organizations, and um, we see lots of criminal organizations surveilling uh, shippers with valuable goods and trying to steal the trailers uh, and or tractors. I think this is another example in our country where those uh, need to be held accountable that are violating the trust of people. So uh, hold the faith, keep the faith, and uh, I yield back. Mr. Day, today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. And uh, being from the East Bay of San Francisco Bay Area, very directed at your earlier comments about Highway 5 and putting the infrastructure on renewables and matching it up to al alternative fuel fleets, uh, both heavy duty and cars and trucks. So you mentioned uh, we work on the spine, Highway 5, up and down the West Coast. But then for people like me to get to the Port of Oakland um, or to get to the urban areas, getting through restricted geography, which is not dissimilar to some degree from Puget Sound, not just Highway 9, but how you envision connecting uh, Highway 5 to the urban areas, particularly, um, well, Seattle, Portland, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and Los Angeles, San Diego. In, in the context of uh, alter, alternative alternative fuels, fuels. Yes. so that that new generation of energy, how do we make sure it's connected, including with the public sector? One of my admonitions in this con committee uh, to the secretary and others is let's put it where the market is. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we we are working on uh, charging stations uh, along the I-5 corridor, along the I-90 corridor. I'm sure down in California or on the I-80 corridor as right. well uh, for uh, light trucks and passenger vehicles, uh, and building that system out as we go, working with the Metropolitan Planning Organization on a regional plan for the Central Puget Sound. In the freight space, we're working with industry and with our partners in Oregon and in California. Um, we have the uh, privilege of, uh, you know, PACCAR is headquartered in Washington State, and I've had the opportunity to drive their new fuel cell trucks and, and, and the like. The technology is there. Uh, we have a cost problem right now. So, you know, one of the things we're doing is we're, we're working on where can we intercede and make those trucks more affordable for drayage companies and the like. And the other is putting the fueling in place. We are uh, blessed with abundant hydropower in Washington State, which gives us a great opportunity to produce hydrogen at low cost uh, at the dams. So, all of that work is going on, and we're, again, collaborating with Oregon and Washington. We have the West Coast Electric Vehicle Highway in place. We have the West Coast uh, Heavy uh, Vehicle Highway in place. Uh, with the IIJA, we're getting uh, federal dollars into the, the vehicle charging and into, into research and the like. So a, a lot of progress in that space. Uh, these things take time, though. And secondarily, the workforce that does this. Um, our renewable portfolio standard in California when I was in the legislature, the IBW benefited from that greatly. Not all um, unions or non-union people did, but just because of the nature of that. Uh, the nature of deep water ports on the West Coast and the Pacific Rim um, and energy. I have four fossil f uh, refineries in my district. Transitioning that workforce with the same map that we look at financing for transportation and regulatory efforts for air quality and the $380 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act, the Davis-Bacon provisions and in the infrastructure bill, just looking at between your labor department and your transportation people and your resource people. California, we struggle with this time because we're a big state, is getting everybody to coordinate because there are plenty of jobs as I look at it when we transition the workforce and it's not just uh, the IBW. Could you speak to efforts that you're doing either in Washington State or in collaboration with your partners you know, to uh, make sure that the workforce, there's a clear transition that's healthy for the economy, not shutting off fossil fuels, but that transition and that partnership? Uh, transitions are important, Congressman. And, uh, you know, if there's anything I've learned over the last 45 years is if you don't do things with people, they assume you're doing it to them and you kind of deserve what you get. So, 
when we're looking at these transitions, like I, I was the board chair of the Intelligent Transportation Society of America for a while, and we were talking about mobility on demand and automated vehicles and the rest. And I said, you need to have labor at the table when those conversations are going on. As we've decarbonized our fleet, like our Washington State Ferries fleet, going to a hybrid electric ferry means we're gonna need more electrical skills, maybe less diesel mechanic skills. Diesel mechanics are concerned, you know, bring them to the table, have those conversations together. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities if we, uh, if we work as a team. Well, and you talk to a steel worker or UA member or a boilermaker, it's even more of a transition and their concerns as they should be, but their jobs are still valuable and doing the sure. transition right, you've got a lot of experience at. So the modeling you've done is a, valuable to us and to the degree that you can inform us on how we can make that more effective, uh, that would be appreciated. You back. Mr. Owens. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member. Uh, first of all, thank you for your insight. It's been very informative so far. And, Obviously, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, the Biden administration has failed to address, let alone acknowledge, the crisis of our border, our southern border, as, as has been spoken today and talked about, has led to shutdowns of essential rail crossings, threatening billions in cross-border rail traffic commerce that fuels our, our economy. As President Biden continues record spending on tax, taxpayer dollars on woke policies, our critical infrastructure remains compromised. We see bike lanes being prioritized over building and shoring up our bridges. We see charges for EVs that only a minority of Americans can use, prioritized over a robust, consistent electric grid that every American needs. We see the Biden administration's Department of, Edge of Transportation clearly picking favorites by allocating funding for deep blue inner city rail projects, while at the heart of our nation, our rural communities are increasingly falling behind. <clears throat> Across my district, small business and corporations depend on a state-of-the-art infrastructure that supports the easy, convenient, and consistent movement of goods, services, and people. This ensures successful businesses and the growth of a robust, successful middle class. Instead, the Biden administration is giving us a crushing woke regu regulatory agenda. Uh, this is for everyone, and I'm going to start with Mr. Edwards. Uh, uh, each year, 32,000 CB CBP officers provide trade enforcement uh, at 30 328 ports of entry processing more than 24 million containers by sea, truck, and rail. In Utah, we're innovating to execute a bold vision of an inland port authority. Uh, at, uh, at, as this committee and transportation industry looks at moderate, modernizing the way we trade, how do inland ports fit the objective to improve trade, minimize supply chain bottlenecks, and hold China accountable? Mr. Edwards, we we'll start off with you. So to be clear, Congressman, your question was how do inland ports Assist, yes. in the, assist in the process. So at the Port of Virginia, we operate um, two inland ports, one in Richmond and one in Front Royal in northern Washington, and we are looking at a further one in, in southwest Virginia. The, the way it, into, it helps with supply chain is the speed with which we move the goods through the seaport. So we're taking them away from the largest nodal point. As, the cargo is moving through the largest nodal point as fast as we can, and then, allow, and then it can move in bond, and that allows for CBP to do their work at a, at a further inland location. Um, that still requires that cargo to go through screening because it is coming into the United States at first port of entry, so it will be screened at the first location from a, sa from a safety perspective. But it is this, the fluidity that it provides into the supply chain is where the benefit is. Okay, thank you. Ms. Spiller? Yeah, I, on the intermodal uh, port uh, issue, uh, there are a lot of small inland ports in Washington State that very much want to be that facility. but. We have to understand the market for that and, and how that works in terms of moving freight nationally. Do, and do, that do moving freight nationally may mean that the appropriate place for an intermodal port isn't in Washington State. It's in Utah. It's in Wyoming. It's, it's somewhere else. And so having those conversations at a regional or corridor scale is important. We're working right now as a part of the AASHTO team. There's an Interstate 80 corridor that's looking from the West Coast to the East Coast. What what do we do as a team uh, to make that corridor smarter and, and more efficient? We have the same thing on the I-90 corridor on the northern side, and then I-10 as well. Okay. It's, it's more I, than I, the I, individual I, states. I, I want to make sure we get some feedback so, also, so, so thank you so much. Just real quickly, and then uh, Ms. Mifford, I have a question for you at the very end. So. 
Congressman, I, I'd say that I agree with what has been said thus far, and, and if it's okay with you, I'd, I could respond in, later in writing. Okay, thank you so much. Ms. Benford, um, as you know, last month, the Federal Highway Administration released a final ruling requiring states to set new standards of acceptable greenhouse gas emissions on the national highway system. Aside from the fact that this administration does not have the legal authority to implement a greenhouse gas performance measure, Rural communities in my district have raised concerns that small municipalities cannot reduce, replace uh, computer, uh, commuter traffic, auto traffic, and, and reduce carbon emissions with new, high, uh, new subways or, or rapid transit bus systems. Do you share any of these concerns about the demands made on these type of uh, environments, these type of communities? Yes, I, I think I would share all the concerns that you just said. Um, being a real, rural community, again, I said I mentioned earlier that we admit less um, carbon dioxide emissions than many other states, and so for us to uh, follow those rules and, and decrease our emissions, would we are afraid what that would look like um, to our transportation system and what kind of projects may not come out because of that. Well, I look forward to working with you on that because we have the very same concerns and across the country, rural country, uh, communities would do the same. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Gentleman yields uh, back. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for being here. You know, I don't see how we can talk about the state of transportation without acknowledging the just uh, historic investments that were made by the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the work that Secretary Buttigieg and Mitch Landrieu have done identifying good projects uh, involving governments at all levels, uh, emphasizing equity, uh, and getting the money out the door as soon as possible. I represent Southern Nevada, Las Vegas primarily, and I have been working for many years since 2001 to get a speed train between Las Vegas and Southern Nevada. And now that's become a reality. We had uh, $3 billion appropriated out of this bill to start this speed train. They expect that it'll be done in time for the Olympics in Los Angeles. We are, uh, have labor agreements in place. We also have done the environmental studies. It's about ready to break ground. And listen to how it will be such a game changer. It's gonna generate over $10 billion in economic activity, reduce carbon monoxide emissions by 400,000 tons, create more than 35,000 construction jobs, most of which are labor jobs, good paying, good benefit jobs. So that is certainly a benefit that we have as we talk about the state of uh, transportation. Also though, we're seeing a record amount of funding from bipartisan infrastructure law and the IRA about water quality, preventing erosion, keeping more water in Lake Mead. Uh, this, all, this helps to preserve the viability of natural resources in the West and certainly ties to transportation. So I would ask you, Secretary Miller, if looking at the fact that Nevada has received over $6.2 billion from these laws, with many of the investments uh, focused on underserved groups or underrepresented groups, and that includes $580 million to ensure greater access to broadband, including in these rural areas that some have suggested aren't getting their share, and also millions in funding to improve the interconnectedness of public transit that so many people use to get to school, get to work, get to the doctor. Uh, so I would say, what are some of the ways that you are using it in Washington to expand access for these populations and in keeping with one of the goals of the administration for equity and transportation? Well, thank you for that question. Um, we are spending formula dollars uh, and we are uh, encouraging our local governments to apply for the discretionary grant dollars in a number of areas. Uh, one program, uh, the uh, PROTECT program, for example, we elected to sub-allocate all of the money that Washington State got to local governments, and we're working with two Native American tribes. They're, uh, they're towns, their villages, the, the headquarters of their tribal units are on the Washington coast and they're subject to sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And so we're using the protect money to move those communities back and up so that they are safe. Uh, we are also making a point of investing 
uh, in uh, the overburdened communities of Washington State. You know, we have the, you know, the Justice 40 stuff that we talk about at a national level. In Washington State, we call it the Healthy Environment for All Act or the HEAL Act. Uh, that requires us to put an, uh, an equity lens on every expenditure that we make. So the money we're receiving for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure is going into overburdened communities. The money we receive for public in transportation infrastructure is going into overburdened communities. The money we receive for preservation work is going into overburdened communities. We put together a bridge program, a competitive bridge program for bridge rehabilitation and replacement for local governments, um, up to 25 million a project, no local match requirement at all. In 2023, we did 50 local bridges with that money. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Those are the kind of things we should be doing, and those are the goals of the administration, not only to have policy across all levels of government, but to go into all parts of the community. Something that we're working on, too, I'm, I suspect it's kind of like your HEAL Act, are the safe streets, to be sure the streets are safe for all kinds of transportation, whether somebody's walking or riding a bicycle, taking the bus, on one of the little scooters if you're disabled. Uh, and that's another way we can spread this money to all communities. So I appreciate hearing from you about that. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Now to the man with the brightest tie I've ever seen in my life, Mr. Van Drew. Thank you, Chairman. It was a dark, cold morning, and I was up very early. And I just wanted to brighten my day. I'm getting ready for St. Patty's Day, too. Uh, Mr. Tucker, you're from New Jersey. What part of New Jersey? From Haddonfield, New Jersey. Okay. So, well, I'm not almost in your, your district, but not quite. As you know, I have six counties in South Jersey, about 40% of the state geographically. So I bet you you come down to my district and vacation once in a while. I, I own a uh, place in, uh, yeah, at the beach, Ocean City. Wish ta Ocean City, beautiful. G glad to hear it. Spend a lot of money when you're there. Um, anyhow, thank you, Mr. Chair. Joe Biden, uh, which is going to be an unusual tact I'm taking, but you got to follow me with this. He's let the southern border crisis get so bad that it is even affecting our nation's supply chain. This past September and December, there were two separate shutdowns of international freight rail, crossings at El Paso and Eagle Pass, Texas. And, and there was no indication of when they would even reopen. These closures were due to an historic influx of illegal immigration. We all know it, we see it. There's over 8 million illegal immigrants in a few more months have entered the country. 300,000 illegal entries just in the month of December. 300,000 at the current rate the number of illegal immigrants in our country will exceed the population of our home state, the state of New Jersey, in as little as five more months. The administration is literally creating the 51st state and the 10th most populous fully comprised of illegal aliens. These realities are contributing to the issues our supply chain faces even thousands of miles away from the southern border. It affects the entire country. In total, these rail border crossings account for roughly $34 billion in commerce. This is just one facet of our supply chain. How much more money does our country need to lose due to the effects of these illegal crossings? How much more evidence does this administration need before it will finally take action. Enough is enough. Mr. Tucker, my friend from New Jersey, this question is for you. How do these closures impact both security and our supply chain relating to the southern border? Uh, Congressman, the, uh, the unexpected uh, nature of the, the closures uh, of, for freight is, is, um, is harmful. Right. It's harmful for uh, the railroads, it's harmful for the truck drivers, it's harmful for the shippers, it's harmful for the receivers, it's harmful for the processors who are expecting to receive those goods, it's harmful for the retailers, it's harmful for the consumers. Right? Uh, it, there, is a, there, is a, uh, there there's a humanitarian crisis associated with what's happening uh, down there with individuals jumping onto the train. 
children and 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 women and 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 men and and people of all ages. So, I I uh, as I said earlier, I'm glad that I am not the one in charge having to deal with this mess. But um, what I can encourage our leaders to do is to work more closely, collaborate more, and communicate more with industry uh, to engage industry's help, uh, engage and give industry time to to um, figure alternative routes if uh, if if a crisis occurs. And 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 uh, so that, that's that's the main message: is we're here. Um, we're very involved every single day in the supply chain, and, and we're really smart people. But when we're, um, you know, surprised and we don't have anything, uh, uh, any opportunities to, to divert in enough time, that's very painful. I, I appreciate your candid answer. Um, I have one more question. I know we only have a few seconds, but there's a lot of new technology out there. And this new technology enables us to have autonomous trucking, which concerns me a great deal. If you could briefly comment on that. And also what concerns me is uh, the new technology. I bought a new vehicle, a GMC. Uh, I guess not politically correct, a Yukon Denali, but I have a lot of people that sometimes travel with me, and it's very safe and good. But the interesting thing, when I was updating the computer on that, when they wanted to update it, they said I, they would have to disable it for 15 minutes. Is there actually the ability now, whoever knows the best on this can answer it, the ability to have a kill switch on a vehicle? And couldn't that expose us because of cyber, uh, you know, some of the cyber piracy that goes on? Who wants to answer that real quick? I, I, I can't answer the question about is there that ability and, and, and does it relate to trucking. Uh, I, I can't. That's not my specialty. I will say that I, too, am concerned about the security and the nature of security uh, when you have a, you know, 80,000 pound vehicle on the on the road one day and perhaps it could be hacked into. I think a lot of work needs and, to be. And I know my time is up, but if they can turn it off to update it, they can turn it off just to turn it off and somebody else might be able to hack into that. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank you all for, uh, for, for being here today. Um, uh, before I get started, Ms. Benford, uh, Ms. Malloy asked you um, about some of the regulatory, and I, I want to I clarify one thing. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a quick story. When, when Mitch Landrieu called and, and was talking to me about, about being named the infrastructure czar, potentially taking that position, he asked me what I thought. And I told him, I said, here's your problem. Your problem is that this administration's regulatory agenda is entirely incompatible with the infrastructure agenda, meaning your regulatory agenda, it just continues becoming more and more bureaucratic, more and more red tape, more and more steps. And, and so you can't build things. And, we, and we've seen that. As a matter of fact, uh, taking Brookings Institute data from November of last year, time-wise, we were about 40% through the, the implementation of the IIJA. Uh, however, dollar-wise, we still have 80% of the money in the bank um, and, and, and the, the discretionary money in the bank. And, and on top of it, when you start looking at the discretionary dollars, and I think this is a compounding problem, um, uh, I think it's 80%, excuse me, I think it's 50%, 50% of the discretionary funds are, um, are actually being spent on projects of $1 million or less. And so, look, Everybody in this room supports infrastructure. We wouldn't be on this committee if we, if we didn't. But our problem, I think, at least on this side of the dais, is that the infrastructure bill is not focused upon true federal obligations or true federal needs. Um, uh, Mr. Edwards, you have the Gateway Project, this massive $1.4 $1. 4 billion project that's um, it, under your jurisdiction. If we're going to go out there and we're going to sprinkle these little two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar grants all over, it's not advancing large scale projects that I think really include not just the interest of the federal government, but the obligation of responsibility. Lastly, Ms. Benford, coming back to, to my point here, those changes that you cited on dates and on pages, it's not because the administration or CEQ wanted to do it. It's because we mandated they do. 
Um, uh, we worked on legislation that was implemented that I will tell you, the White House did not want to sign. They were forced to do it. Um, it was one of, I think, the crown accomplishments of this Congress of, of folks. And, and it's not just about a 75-page limit on an EA, 150-page limit on an EIS. It's not about a one-year limit on an EA, a two-year limit on an EIS. It raises the threshold and when NEPA applies, it limits the scope to only reasonably foreseeable impacts. It ensures one federal decision, not having this committee of folks out there trying to make decisions on natural resources. It's, it's really is uh, crazy what's going on right now. Um, uh, Mr. Miller, excuse me, Secretary Miller, you, you noted the improper, perhaps, uh, resourcing of agencies. Um, I think we need to ask a different question. You were saying it, that's why it takes so long to get these things done. I think we need to ask a different question. Are we appropriately scoping the, 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 the projects from a, from a NEPA or an environmental review or a regulatory perspective. That's the first question. We don't need to go out there and go do all these useless steps. And I'll give you an example. When Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened in the Gulf of Mexico, we're looking through the, the oil spill plants. They're talking about walruses and polar bears. Not kidding. In, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so we can't go out there and go waste money on things that, that simply don't make sense. Um, so... so um, uh, Mr. Edwards, I want to ask you a question about, uh, about your participation in projects and if, if you have ideas or thoughts on how we could further streamline the implementation of projects and stop all of this regulatory uh, red tape and just getting wrapped around the axle. All right, Congressman, thank you. I, what, I, what I would say is actually from a, taking a slightly different tact is that we actually have a, a, a Virginia Port Authority, we're a political subdivision, we stand alone. Um, but we have an excellent working relationship with the Commonwealth of Virginia as a whole. And what we found on an integrated approach is we have been able to succeed. So we have been able to, to get um, the dollars we, we take to work. Now, it may be unique in our, in our space. I've mentioned prior to two of your colleagues that we do believe there's some modernization needed within places like the Maritime Administration on their NEPA approach. But as a, as a general Point of order. Whether it's I've either got a great team who know how to do this, or we have managed to get we have managed to work our way, way through bureaucracies, but we are actually managing to get to work, and we're not holding up our gateway project. Thank you, uh, Secretary Miller. I want to ask you a quick question. Uh, half my family lives up in, uh, and and have lived in the in the Whidbey, um, uh, Port Angeles, uh, Squeamish, uh, Vashon areas, and I've spent plenty of time on on your ferries. Do, do you have any, any feedback on how the federal government could do a better job scoping where its focus is as opposed to trying to throw a nickel at every $10 problem across the country? I, I think focusing strategically on projects like the Interstate 5 bridge over the Columbia River or the Puget Sound Gateway. Lots of people are doing gateways. We're doing a $2 billion one. But uh, identifying the programs and projects that are truly of national significance and putting programs like the mega grant program, for example, together to address them, while at the same time addressing the rural communities and small towns who want a piece of the pie as well. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, we have a $2 billion bridge in my hometown that should have been done 40 years ago. There's an I-10 bridge in Lake Charles that's on I-10 that is, is uh, dilapidated. It, it is incredible watching dollars being thrown at inappropriate priorities, and I really think we need to help uh, the federal government focus. Yield back. Ms. gonzalez Colon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, the witnesses, for, for coming here today. I want to I want to try to be brief, but Puerto Rico cannot be except, uh, an exception of what, on what what is happening uh, in terms of the nation. Uh, actually, the um, Association of General Contractors and American Society of Civil Engineers rank infrastructure on the highland with a D minus. When the average overall score for the U.S. was C minus. So, to that sense. Um, as you may know, Puerto Rico relies heavily on, on the maritime and, and shipping industry, and any delays or restrictions um, on um, maritime routes can potentially impact our island uh, during regular operations, and more dramatically during emergency operations. Having said that, I do have a question for uh, Ms. Bettenford. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, Puerto Rico remains on the path uh, towards recovery in the aftermath of the Hurricane Sidney Maria back in 2017. And since then, we, we have received historic allocations of emergency funds, some of which are meant to address our transportation infrastructure, including bridges, ports, roads, and, and our power grid. Um, 
time is the essence of all these funds and um, are available for a limited amount of time and they're desperately needed in, uh, by the residents of the island. And contractors are the key stakeholders. Uh, could you please share some of your setbacks or challenges in terms of, uh, if any, that has been identified by the AGC as a hindrance for contractors to bid or partake in disaster recovery projects uh, financed by emergency federal funds? Yes, so um, what I would say is, as a contractor, there are three keys to us being successful, um, problem solving, collaboration, and uh, schedule, right? And so um, I'll go back to, and workforce is also an issue, and we, we've talked a lot about that today, but for us to be successful as a team and make sure that we actually get this money implemented on the ground for the public, it, it means that all parties have to work together, right? So we've talked about permitting, all these things have been talked about today, and I think just to kind of sum it up, it, it requires everybody to be at the table and willing to um, take the necessary steps to make sure that we can get this in place for, for the public. You talk about permitting, we talk about workforce, um, and I do agree with that. In my office view, view the Association of General Contractor, Contractors, especially the, the Puerto Rico chapter, um, as a key stakeholder in assessing uh, the state and the rate of construction uh, through federal funds and state investment, but we do experience the same thing like many of the states of the nation, the rising costs on, on, on construction, uh, and that, that is a big concern. We still got a lot of money that is not being used because we don't have the workforce uh, to actually use it. Um, and same thing happened across the country. But in your views, are, these, are there any flexibilities that we can identify or put in place uh, as regulations, as amendments to laws, uh, whether those be regulatory or in statute that will support contractors or contractors, contracting companies operating in areas with, with increase or fluctuating construction costs that we can help. Um, I have heard ideas related to potentially increasing flexibilities for uh, escalation cost is one of, uh, one of those. Um, will be that a helpful um, alternative. Another issue is, of course, the lack of workforce, and, and you can share what is the best practice, some of the best practices the AGC are adopted by states that lead to larger workforce numbers. So I'll start with uh, price escalation. Um, our state does have price escalation. I would say that as COVID hit and some other um, supply chains occurred, we did meet with our DOTs to try and get other supplies um, on those lists. And I think one thing that would be helpful is the 1980 uh, uh, Federal Highways Memo could be updated. A lot of people were confused as to whether they could utilize that memo um, when we were trying to get some other supplies on that list. And workforce, it's been talked a lot about, but what, what I, as a contractor, um, workforce is our number one resource. And so we have to do what is best for them to retain and recruit them. And the best option for us is flexibility, right? Not one size fits all of us um, contractors in every state, even in the same state. We all have a different way to operate. We all have a different expectation of what our products look like. So it, it's really flexibility, right? Giving us the ability tools, but not mandating that those tools have to be utilized. Thank you. I know I'm running out of time, but I just want to say uh, to Mr. Edwards that uh, Puerto Rico is heavily uh, reliant on commer commercial maritime industry. Uh, so that means that things like water uh, are most expected uh, to work with ports and bays on the island um, and the Army Corps of Engineers to, for, for port maintenance and improvements. And I know this committee is working to that end as well. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Burleson. Ms. Benford, um, in light of the trillions of dollars that have been spent on our transportation infrastructure, um, we still have a C minus rating, which has been mentioned earlier in this hearing, um, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers. And when it comes to that infrastructure, some people might be asking why? How, how do we get to the point where we have a C minus rating despite how much money is being spent? So I'd say that, um, 
our company really hasn't seen the dollars yet, and even in our state. So um, as I mentioned in my testimony, there's a, la there's a lag between the dollars that actually got sent to the states, um, the design of those projects, and then us as contractors actually seeing the work. So I would say the bulk of the work actually hasn't hit us yet, and um, we're hoping. For Wyoming, we've been told that the end of 2024 into 2025 will be when we see that work hit. You know, I know this place likes to think that dollars are unlimited, but um, the fact is they're not. Um, I'm looking at one of the appropriations I consider wasteful, a wasteful program, and that is the uh, nearly $8 billion that's sent to, to um, create electric vehicle charging stations, which in my opinion is a method of robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's, it's robbing individuals from one sector of the economy or individuals who decide not to use an electric vehicle to subsidize and pay for the infrastructure for a, the pri a private sector entity and or, and or individuals that are using electric vehicles. Well, I don't think it's fair. But when I reflect on the fact that nearly $8 billion, what's, how much is that? You know, in this place, that's not a lot of money. But you know where I come from? That's a hell of a lot of money. $8 billion. Missouri, we, we weren't able to expand. We had a d dramatic need to expand I-70, and we still have a need to expand I-44 I because of the amount of, of traffic. Um, it's going to, Missouri, because of that, that, the bill that did pass, is going to spend $2.8 billion to expand I-70 all the way from St. Louis to Kansas City. That's a long ways. Mm -hmm. And yet, when I think about the impact that $8 billion could have if it's spent appropriately, it could, it could really impact a lot of people. Correct? Yeah, I'd agree. I think it goes back to the flexibility of each state, right? Um, I know that... Uh, Every state has different needs, and so we just have to have that in mind. Is it fair to say that it may not be that we have a spending problem, it's, it's uh, how we're prioritizing those dollars? Yep, again, back to flexibility to give everyone. I, for us in Wyoming, I know we struggle with the EV stations in general, right? We, we travel hundreds of miles between cities, and so we would be putting two or three between each city, um, and then how do you power those? So there's challenges that come with designating money on its own. And we could, like you said, we could be using those dollars in different ways in, in our infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Tucker, another reason why we have transportation issues and infrastructure issues that we place, in my opinion, a heavy regulatory burden on, on the industry. For example, trucking is not provided the flexibility that they need for their hours of service. Uh, IMSA is close to finalizing a rule that would mandate the installation of speed limiters in trucks. Um, freight rail must give passenger rail, like Amtrak, the preference over the use of their rails, even though they don't even own the rail. Um, aviation is stifled by regulations requiring a shortage of pilots um, because we, we limit how many hours or we require a certain number of hours. With these examples, do you believe that strict regulations is a big reason why our transportation infrastructure is lacking? Excuse me. Uh, I think there's there are a lot of different uh, reasons. I certainly, uh, regulation is 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 one of them. I think um, again. Uh, I've spoken frequently today about fraud in our industry, and that really does begin to slow things down. It causes a lot of uh, a lot of pain, a lot of loss of cargo. And um, I, you know, want to want to reiterate the importance of focusing, uh, you know, for FMCSA to focus on safety, and 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 a little bit less on um, obscure regulations that have. Uh, are, are 50 years old or so and, and have no, no bearing today. We're still dealing with this as a, as a, as a trucking industry. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Well, thank you very much. Looking around, I don't see any other members uh, who have questions. I'd like to thank our witnesses uh, for uh, their endurance today. It's been about three hours, 15 minutes. 
and uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to have, have the uh, back and forth very uh, informative. Um, seeing no other members uh, with questions, this concludes our hearing for today. I'd like to thank each of our witnesses again for being here and their time.